I'd like to call to order the Malibu City Council regular meeting of January 27th, 2020. May I please have a roll call? Councilmember Mullen? Here. Councilmember Peek? Here. Councilmember Wagner? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Pearson? Here. Mayor Fair? Here. You have a quorum. Thank you. May I please have an approval of the agenda? I move to approve the agenda. Do we have a second? I'll second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Uh, yeah, Scott Dietrich, would you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Thank you, Scott. May I have a report on the posting of the agenda? The agenda for this meeting was properly posted on January 27, 2020. Thank you, Kelsey. Okay, do we have any speaker cards? Okay, item 2A, uh, would you please come to the front and be ready to speak? Uh, Benjamin Pollock, you're first. Jewel Johnson, Lloyd Ahern, Jessica Wen, and Elena Eager. Well, hello. I'm uh, just going to read a few things and say a few things off the cuff here uh, real quick. Uh, thank you, City Council, for sponsoring the 19th Malibu Film Festival, whose services benefit uh, the residents and businesses of Malibu. My name is Benjamin Pollock. I'm a filmmaker. Uh, I live in Malibu, and I have a business here with uh, my wife. We own uh, Thomason Management Group, which is a, uh, a beauty agency. Uh, we're located in the Country Mart. Uh, we've lived here uh, about seven years or so. I've worked here for many, many years of, as a filmmaker. My house uh, burnt down in the, um, in the Malibu fire, uh, and uh, I uh, made a, a short documentary um, about it. It's not a finger-pointing documentary. It's really just a slice of life. It's a, about me and my experiences meeting my wife and living here and, uh, and losing everything, and kind of a weird... Uh, Weird moment in life when uh, you lose everything and you realize, well, you have more than you thought you did, you know. But anyway, so I, I uh, made this documentary and uh, they were kind enough to show it. It's at one o'clock in the afternoon. It, it's going to be a free showing, so I'm here to invite you all and the entire city of Malibu and everyone else in the world uh, to come see it. It's, uh, it's free. Um, you do have to RSVP, so the, all the information is uh, on the, the uh, MalibuFilmFestival.com. I believe, uh, and um, um, I think also um, David Katz also wanted to extend a thank you uh, for sponsoring and and for making this thing possible. And so I uh, wanted to thank you very much and to come meet you personally and, and say thank you myself. So thank you. Thank okay. you, Benjamin. That's it. Thank you. Next up is Jewel Johnson and then Lloyd Ahern. Good evening. You have slides. This is going to be really quick, just kind of give you an update of what's been going on with the Rangers since we, I was here in, Jan, in June. Was it June? Yes, yeah, June. Um, is this the button? Again, that's our coastal patrol area of Ventura County, that's the Palisades. So again, this is from July of 2019 to today. In July, we had um, the Ranger Service calls, one called about fishing in um, Carbon Beach. We don't, we just maintain the access, we don't maintain the beach. 
Um, again, Carbon Beach West um, got two calls, a dead seal. I just had a question. Um, do they call, I call, told them to call the city of Malibu. Is that the right number to call? I just I kind of just send them to the, I think the if website. If the seal's injured, you could call the California Wildlife Center, but if it's a deceased seal, usually they stay at the beach or get yeah. buried in the sand. Okay, and the same thing left bag on the beach. I just kind of like just tell them to contact the city of Malibu unless somebody turned it in, but August and September, we didn't have any ranger service calls. October, we had uh, one call about some divers in the ocean that wouldn't leave the ocean. November, December, another quiet month, no ranger service calls. In January, um, someone called about Charmley. And then there was filming on Latigo. I told them again, call, contact the city of Malibu because they were filming on the beach. Our numerous overlook, Miramar overlook, there's no reported issues. Um, the good news is the private property owner uh, across the street, they actually found and dealt with the encampments on his property. They actually removed like six tons of trash from the private property just this week. That was across from our, our overlook. And again, Dolphin View Coastal Overlook, no reported issues. We had heard at a meeting last week that there was a lot of issues, but we didn't receive any calls about that, and there's been no damage to the, the overlook. So um, at the end of the slide, I have my, the Ranger Service number, so if you people do see things at the overlook, it's good to give us a call so that we can like, shift our schedule and our patrols. Again, no reported access um, issues and other access points. We did have a homeless encampment we found at Malibu Bluffs. We continue to monitor that. Um, since we came in June, we cleaned it out. We found one more camp, not in the same location, just a little further into the ravine. This is before the cleanup. This is after. And we put back our restoration area closed sign. They had taken taken thrown that someplace. And again, that's my email and myself, my um, work number um, and our range of service calls. So again, if you see anything on our over, overlooks or our property, feel free to give us a call back. You will get a call back. Even if it's one o'clock in the morning, you'll get a call back. We might not have a ranger in the area, but if we do, we'll definitely send somebody out. Thank you, Jewel. Thanks. Our next speaker is Lloyd Ahern, followed by Jessica Wen and Elena Egger. Uh, this is really nice to see that Jules here. We've been complaining about enforcement, and they've obviously heard us because this is kind of a, like a minor miracle that they've come here tonight to address the problems that we've been complaining about. Everybody got this little handout of the um, of the scoping meeting that we had Wednesday night at uh, King Gillette Ranch, and what happened was uh, it was notice. Uh, uh, it was the scoping meeting was from December 6th to February 6th. They had the meeting on January 22nd, so that we don't have a lot of time. What we want to do is ask MRCA to, they, they're going to make new access ways seven, but first before they do that, I want them to fix the 12 that they, they don't do well. She says they don't do maintenance. I mean, they don't do um, uh, patrolling. They should be doing patrolling. The other night, I, I've got little little arrows next to the three people. Jefferson Wagner, Bonnie Boo, I hope she's here, she's not, and um, Craig Hill. We should all be so thankful that we're a city because if we weren't a city and we went to this meeting, which they want to call it a public works program instead of a, our LCP, we'd be roadkill. These people are changing the rules as we go along, just moving the goalpost. So what I want to request tonight is that Bonnie, who did a magnificent presentation, Jefferson did a magnificent presentation at this meeting about what we consider the, the right way to do access ways. I want Bonnie to write down all the things she got up and spoke about. She was 
she listened to the whole meeting and then at the last second she got up and she totally changed the course of what they want to do. They want to do a thing without, the, the city was ranked six in who they want to uh, in, inform. I said we should take the city and make it number one. Um, if Bonnie will um, write a report, which I, somebody in the planning department can tell her and I'll, and I'll ask her. That would be great. And in the future, when they do Bluffs Park, I want us to establish how these access ways go under our LCP, not some bologna sandwich uh, public works program. And I want to look to the future so the scoping meeting is in this rim, not at King Gillette Ranch at 6 o'clock at night when, when you, can, you can't even find the place. So um, I just want to say let's never let Bonnie Blue go. She's a real treasure. Okay, thanks for, for everything. Bonnie, wherever you are, I hope you heard it. <laughs> Thank you, Lloyd. Next is Jessica Wen and Elena Eager. Hi, um, Elena Eager is actually giving me her minute, so she won't be speaking. I had a presentation also. Okay. Good evening, council members. I'm here today to inform you that the State Coastal Conservancy and the Mountains Recreation and Conservation Authority are developing the Malibu Coastal Access Public Works Plan, which I will be referring to as the proposed PWP. We published a notice of preparation for an EIR on December 9th and provided notice pursuant to the California Environmental Quality Act. The primary objectives of the proposed PWP are to increase public access and recreation opportunities along the coast in Malibu. The proposed PWP covered the Im implementation and management of 17 beach access ways, access improvements for seven sites, policies related to public access and development and management, public access and recreation, and natural resources protection to provide for the operation and maintenance of all 17 access ways included in the PWP. Preparation of the proposed PWP enables the Coastal Conservancy and MRCA to achieve efficiency in the permitting phase. Absent a comprehensive public works plan, a coastal development permit would be required for each individual access project, including individual environmental documentation, which is a lengthy and expensive process. Under a public works plan, one environmental document would be prepared, and once the public works plan and the environmental documentation receive approval, the subsequent review and approval of the individual projects can be streamlined. There are 10 access ways with site numbers preceded by the letter M that are currently open and are being developed under entitlements from other CDPs. These sites would be subject to the management policies in the PWP. There are seven access ways with site numbers preceded by the letter D that are proposed to be improved and would be subject to both the development policies and management policies in the PWP. In general, access improvements at the seven D sites would contain design elements such as stairways, gates with automatic time blocks, fencing, guardrails, walkways or decks, portable restrooms with enclosures, and access signage. These design elements are intended to be consistent among the different sites in appearance, materials, and dimensions where applicable. The MRCA manages and maintains all the access ways included in the PWP and would continue to manage and maintain these access ways. The operation and maintenance provisions in the PWP incorporate existing protocols that the MRCA currently uses to manage its access ways. MRCA rangers are responsible for and would continue to be responsible for the day-to-day -day operation of the access ways related to answering complaint calls, emergency calls, and citations for rules or parking violations. Maintenance includes both regular maintenance and periodic repairs. Some examples of maintenance activities that already occur and would not change as a result of the proposed PWP include trash pickup, graffiti removal, and routine site inspections. Next slide. The public scoping period runs from December 9th through February 7th. We held our public scoping meeting last Wednesday where 22 people attended and provide comments, among them your planning director, Bonnie Blue, and Councilman Jefferson Wagner. We are still accepting comments as to the scope and content of the EIR through 5 p.m. on February 7th and encourages everyone and the city to participate. More information about the proposed PWP can be found online at the web address um, shown on the screen in the next slide. Oh, sorry. 
and um, hard copies of the initial study can be viewed at the location shown on screen. All comments can be mailed or emailed to the addresses on the screen as well. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any items pulled for consent? Oh, thank you. Commissioner report. Scott Dietrich, thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor Fair and Council Members. At last Wednesday's Public Works uh, <coughs> Commission meeting, um, we ran into a problem and we need your solutions. We had, going back to May of last year, considered improving the Civic Center uh, Way project road improvement. We did a number of things in this project. But we asked for two variances. It went to planning, I guess it's two weeks ago. And the planning commission decided to completely reinvent the wheel. Um, this left us very frustrated. We'd considered having DG versus porous concrete uh, for the walkway, and we gave a lot of consideration, and when Public Works Director uh, Rob DeBoat pointed out that we wouldn't be ADA compliant, we went with DG at intersections, we went back to um, porous concrete, even though it was more expensive. Uh, so we'd given a lot of consideration, and then we find everything we'd done had been, I guess in a four-hour planning commission meeting, been turned around. Left us a little angry, frustrated. Um, unfortunately, Rob wasn't at our public works commission meeting. Adam Chase was, who does an excellent job. But there was a key piece of information missing. Uh, planning Commissioner Uring had brought up uh, at the Planning Commission meeting that the residents at Harbor Vista wouldn't have a way to egress or enter on busy days, Friday, particularly Monday. We didn't know about this. So probably with a little bit of anger, we unanimously passed a resolution saying, what the heck are you doing, Planning Commission, trying to undermine what we've just done? So the whole thing became pretty much of a mess. What I'm requesting from Council is that if planning is going to find objections to anything we at Public Works or Public Safety would do, they would turn those objections back to us and let us examine them because I think the current situation left everybody frustrated. And I think that's unnecessary. So if you would direct planning to just return objections, we didn't know about Harbor Vista, so we couldn't act on it. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Do we have any other commission updates? OK. Reva, do you have a city manager update? I do, thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. Um, briefly, I want to give an update on the Civic Center way, uh, roadway issues that we had uh, Friday and Saturday. There was a small sinkhole that occurred above a storm drain. Our public works crews were able to identify the problem and put a temporary fix on there. Um, so the roadway was temporarily closed, but it is back open. 
and we'll be doing um, some further work on that. Um, but I wanted to make sure everybody felt confident that this has nothing to do with a water main. It doesn't have anything to do with the Civic Center wastewater treatment facility. It's related to a storm drain and some roadway uh, that was being undermined by uh, water from the storm drain. So I just want to make sure everybody knew that. Um, also wanted to remind all of our residents, if you still have your Christmas lights up, you're going to have to take them down. Our dark sky ordinance is in effect and holiday lights needed to be down by January 15th. So uh, that should keep you busy if you haven't gotten them down. Um, we also have before the California Coastal Commission on February 13th an appeal of the Point Doom Headlands project and that will be um, in Long Beach before the Coastal Commission. Um, you heard from a couple speakers about the MRCA Public Works Project. Um, comments are due to the MRCA by February 7th. Um, and thank you for those kind comments about Bonnie Blue. Um, she and her staff are in the middle of preparing um, some robust comments. So if you have anything that you think they should know, please definitely contact her. Uh, we have a few upcoming events on Wednesday, January 29th at 6 o'clock. We'll have a special council meeting here in this room. The city council will be discussing homelessness issues. On Thursday, January 30th at 10 a.m. here at City Hall, we'll have a special meeting for the Disaster Council and we'll be discussing um, a proposed evacuation plan for the city. And then uh, later that evening at six o'clock on Thursday, we have a meeting um, on insurance issues and our state insurance commissioner, Ricardo Lara, will be here as well as representatives from the California Fair Plan. And you can make one-on-one -on -one appointments with their staff um, by calling City Hall. I also like to let everybody know that the Culture Arts Commission meeting uh, previously scheduled for tomorrow morning has been canceled due to lack of quorum. Um, I have a wonderful news, which is we are now at 59 building permits that have been issued, um, nine of which have been issued uh, since our last council meeting two weeks ago. And uh, we have two homes that were completed, and it is now my pleasure to play a video of the one uh, that issued its, uh, was issued its uh, COO earlier today.
And that concludes my remarks. Thank you, Reva. Okay, on to council member reports. Uh, who would like to go first? I'll go. Okay, thank you, Rick. Um, I also attended that ribbon cutting ceremony. It was awesome, it was really cool, and it was nice to walk inside and get to talk to all the people who um, were part of that process. It was nice. It uh, feels like you know, we rounded the corner and things are on the upswing, and that was very symbolic of that whole thing. Uh, Ranger Johnson, thank you very much for coming down and sharing your update with us. It's always nice to see you guys down here. We appreciate it. Uh, I went up to, um, although what Lloyd said about Bonnie at uh, the scoping meeting and all that, are we going to get some kind of update on that whole thing? I was unable to attend as I was working, so I'm kind of in the dark as to what the city's position is, et cetera. Um, yes, so staff is working on comments back to the MRCA, and I can certainly provide that back to you uh, once they're completed next week. Okay, great. Thank you. I went up to Sacramento and met with the mayor and the uh, city manager, and we talked to our state elected officials um, about the whole school separation issue uh, to try and uh, iron out all the details of that, and it was, I would say it was a productive trip, and uh, my time there was brief. But it was good. And um, Scott Dietrich, hmm, that's a good point you make. They should kind of send that stuff back to you, I would think. I mean, does that make sense? So do you have any commentary on that? I mean, it's everyone's favorite subject. Um, so if the Planning Commission has recommendations, they actually need to come back to the City Council. If the City Council would like to then redirect a project back to a commission, they can certainly do that. Um, but in the case of the project that Mr. Dietrich was referring to, um, the only um, legal path, I believe, is the right way to describe it for us to do at this point due to the changes that the Planning Commission recommended were to come back to council because it was outside the scope and budget of the proposed project. Okay, thanks for clarifying that, and, and that uh, answers your question, I guess. That is all my comments. Thank you, Rick. Skyler? Uh, thank you, Karen. Um, along with Karen, Rick, and Reva, and Mikey, I also attended that ribbon cutting earlier today, and uh, thank you to all of our staff and everyone that worked on that and is working diligently on all the other projects that are coming before the city right now. Um, I didn't have any other comments, but I think that we should adjourn the meeting in memory of all those that were lost in the helicopter accident nearby over the weekend. Thank you, Skyler. Jefferson? Thank you, Karen. Um, yes, at the MRCA meeting, it was nice to see Jewel. I hope you become the face of the MRCA here in Malibu, as we're familiar with Two Stripe Mike, Jim Braden, our other post-certified law enforcement officers. We're very familiar with um, Lindsay Templeton, Craig Sapp. So let's make you the face of the MRCA here. Uh, it would be great, because then if the questions come up, we have the authority here. It was, and it was nice seeing you at that meeting, and uh, the treats were pretty good. Thanks. Um, uh, equally, um, I did uh, visit the sinkhole. I went down into it four times, and uh, it's, it needs uh, serious work. I'm sure Rob would, would agree with me that uh, once you get down in there, uh, I yanked one of, or two of the uh, local news media down into the hole, and um, it it's, was built in the early 50s. And so I guess we've adopted it as a city, so it'll probably be our responsibility, I'm not sure, uh, on fixing that sinkhole permanently, but hopefully the Civic Center plan moves forward, but I can't comment on that because I'm a property owner on Civic Center Way, so this is the only time I get to talk about it is when it's not on the agenda. So I uh, want to thank everybody that's been working on that project. It seems to have moved along pretty well to a certain point, and uh, hopefully it moves forward soon enough and I get to enjoy the, the wonderful re retreat of work and the uh, trails that we're planning on having there uh, coming down the hill. It looks like a good plan, whatever plan is finally chosen by the other four council members. And uh, that's it for my comments. Thank you. Thanks, Jefferson. Mikey? Thanks, Mayor. Um, thanks to all the speakers. I always appreciate that. Uh, Lloyd, thanks for your comments. Very, very helpful. Um, we were in, up in Sacramento, so thanks for everyone that was there and covered us, and Bonnie and Jefferson, excellent. And uh, Scott, thanks for your comments, very illuminating. 
There you are. Appreciate it very much. And uh, it was a, a great little ceremony at Lori and uh, Murph's house today. I ride my bike by their house every day. They're very close to me. It's just, it's good to see now two houses in my neighborhood uh, rebuilt and people able to move back in. It, um, and I thought that Lori, the homeowner, delivered a really nice little speech just on giving everyone hope and sharing her process and her mind, her mental state of how you get through this and, you know, because it's difficult. And I thought that was really uh, well said and I hope the media picks up on that and shares it with everybody else because uh, she had some really nice comments. Um, for myself, uh, just quickly, I uh, was at a meeting here at City Hall with a few um, people very involved in the homeless issue involving the RVs, which I know we've all been very concerned about. We've received a lot of emails about. Um, I think it was productive, and we'll revisit that Wednesday night. So I just hope people that are as concerned as, as, concerned as some of us are come Wednesday night when we talk exclusively about the homeless issue in Malibu. Um, also, uh, I attended Sheila Kuehl's open house last week. It all blends together. Um, and even in a big crowd, I was uh, also impressed the way Sheila has the ability to uh, have a conversation. We had a great conversation um, for about four minutes in a huge crowd, and um, I really appreciated that her ability to do that. And uh, oh, we spoke about homelessness, and we'll talk more about that Wednesday night. Um, also, Reva, Karen, and Rick and I went up to Sacramento and- uh, But Karen not all Reva, together at the same time. Yeah, not all right. together at the same time. I don't, did I see you, Rick? I saw you very briefly. Maybe you passed somewhere. Yes, but we didn't talk to each other. There you go. <laughs> we go way back. Um, so, but we had some sensational meetings that were really, uh, really excellent. We met with- uh, Mark Tolleson, the Deputy Cabinet Secretary in Gavin Newsom's office. Um, fantastic uh, talk. Oh yeah, wait, about homelessness again. But uh, really great to talk to someone that high up and who's really engaged and bright and passionate and understanding and trying to make a difference. Uh, we talked to Elisa Canova, the Undersecretary of the California State Transportation Agency. She oversees Caltrans and it was, all these meetings were meet and greets because, you know, Gavin's got his new people in there. So we were just really trying to form some relationships and meet people. But we had a great talk about Caltrans and the PCH with her. And um, we hope that can lead to uh, more of a partnership moving forward. And it was really nice to meet her and her crew. And then last we met with Wade Crowfoot, the Secretary for Natural Resources in the state of California. And once again, discussed our partnerships with all the outside agencies. Uh, in the area, and um, he's an impressive individual, very bright, um, and um, I want to just give a lot of credit. To, I know I'm being short on these meetings, what they're about. Some will share Wednesday night more, but I know it's hard to see, but Cal Strategies, our lobbyists, are really good. They have an ability to get us meetings that are hard to get with people that sit down and spend time with us, they really have a great, uh, helpful with strategy and forming the relationships we need to get things done in Malibu. So I really give them credit. Reva did a fantastic job too in these meetings. So it was really, uh, we really made connections that were important for the city of Malibu. And uh, so that, that went really well. And with that, I once again hope everyone will consider coming Wednesday night. Thank you. Thank you, Mikey. Um, my report, I also went to the supervisor's open house, extremely well attended by a lot of people in the room here, and I think everybody on the council was there. Um, I went to the monthly COG meeting, and there was a very positive announcement there that $60,000 of Measure H funding is going to be used to hire a homeless outreach regional coordinator to work with all five COG cities. Um, not surprisingly, Malibu has the uh, majority of the homeless of our COG. Um, but a better part of that news is that the person who has been hired to do this outreach position is somebody who was homeless here in Malibu. And uh, through the work uh, primarily of Paul Elder 
at um, St. Aidan's, uh, this person is now housed and is employed helping others who were not that long ago, uh, or, or who are in the position that he was in not very long ago. So that I was very happy to hear that. Um, yeah, I was in Sacramento also, uh, met with the elected officials that Rick and uh, Mikey mentioned, and also met with uh, the cabinet secretary, um, the secretary for natural resources and uh, State Department of Transportation. And uh, we actually managed to make it to several conference uh, sections of the League of Cities um, conference up there on Thursday. And I will also reiterate what Mikey said. Calstrat also does a really good job of focusing those meetings, which are often brief, and the people we meet with are uh, sometimes rushed and distracted, and then Calstrat helps to wrap it up and work on the next steps. So that is very helpful. Um, yeah, and the ribbon cutting today was really um, very moving. I'm really happy for Lori and Murph. And another thing that Lori said, uh, along with, she was happy to be able to uh, give others hope and inspiration on their projects, is how appreciative she was of all of our staff in helping her to get to this point. So I want to make sure that uh, we acknowledge that. Um, and as for our speakers, um, Ms. Johnson, thank you very much for being here tonight. I appreciate your explanation of um, the work you're doing here in Malibu. Lloyd, yeah, I would have loved to have been at that scoping meeting. You know that. I really appreciate you and everybody else from Malibu who was there. Um, and I, I was able to speak to Bonnie today uh, about what you and I talked about and about what you said this evening here uh, about the way that she wrapped up the meeting and put everything into focus. And, and um, I'm going to be asking her more about that and, and where we go from here. And I agree with you. Those scoping meetings that involve Malibu should be here in Malibu City Hall. And I think, if I might not be going out on a limb here, we could talk about waiving fees to host those meetings here and make it very possible for as many people as possible here in Malibu to attend. Um, Ms. Wen, thank you for being here. Um, you referenced the MRCA Rangers. Um, do you mind coming to the podium? I have a question. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How many rangers are there that work for the MRCA here in Malibu? Um, I think Johnson probably knows that number better than I do. Okay, Ranger Johnson, I'm sorry, do you mind answering that question here at the podium? We have a, probably like one or two rangers that are scheduled to be patrolling the Malibu area, but we have other rangers that can cycle through here um, up to like five to six. But it's going to be no more than one or two. Okay. Yourself and one other, yeah. perhaps? Yeah. Okay. And is that full-time here in Malibu? We don't work primarily. We don't work exclusively in Malibu. Our patrol areas from the Ventura County Board to Pacific Palisades and then inland to Upper Los Verges was in up, which is in Ventura County too. And so Malibu is just one place that we patrol. We patrol the Boholding Corridor, Santa Susana's. We patrol where the areas that we have issues like drinking, smoking, party areas. Okay, thank you. I, I appreciate the work you do, especially knowing how thin you're spread out among that gigantic geographical area. Um, yeah, and I would like to uh, ask anybody who has comments for the MRCA 
uh, regarding these access areas that we saw in the presentation tonight, do please, uh, if you have thoughts on that, go ahead and submit your comments by February 7th at 5 p.m. so that they may be considered. Um, Scott Dietrich, thank you. I appreciate your perspective on the Public Safety Commission. And um, yeah, that particular issue, the Civic Center Way Project, we will be hearing it before the council. But I appreciate you um, voicing your frustration to us on that. Okay, uh, that's it for my report. Was anything pulled from consent other than maybe 3A2? Yes, we have pulled 3A1, 3B5. And did you say 3A2, Skyler? Um, I was going to ask Christy a question on it, so. Yeah, I was going to pull 3A2 and 3B6 for a quick comment. Okay, so uh, I'll make a motion to approve the consent calendar pulling items 3A, 2A1. Or was it 3A1, 3A1, 3A2, 3B5, 3B6. 3B5 and 3B6. All in favor? Well, you got a second. Yeah, second. do we have a second on yeah. that motion? Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. So, do we have a staff report on item 3A1. Mayor, we don't have a prepared presentation on this. Um, this is the second reading of ordinance number 460. So if you have any questions, we can certainly have staff answer them. Okay, thank you. And on 3A1, I would abstain from the vote or either leave the room at the counselor's request. Do I leave the room or just stay and not vote? A 3A1, it's on the parking. Uh, signage because, because you um, I, I have a business that somehow may be implicated uh, so it's probably better that I yes not. and now that it's off the consent calendar you should leave the room okay I'll be out for a Sorry. minute I'll be somebody come get me right away thank you okay thank you Jefferson Okay, public speaker slips, I have a few. Uh, the first one is Barbara Lawrence, followed by Tina Saunders, followed by Amy, is it Rushes? Yes. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to know if we needed to come back uh, Wednesday because this is regarding the homeless. I, I live on Las Tunas Beach. Um, the problem that we have along the highway and the patch, these people are not homeless. They're living in expensive RVs. There is one particular one who's been there for six months with his red BMW that goes with his trailer. And there are about four or five that are literally permanent residents. Um, they're there on weekends with dogs off the leash one of them cursed at my husband yesterday. Um, I've had packages stolen from in front of my house. Uh, they walk up and down and go through our trash. But again, they're not homeless. They're living in their cars by choice. There was an article in the LA Times about people saying they have beachfront properties. I pay taxes, they don't pay taxes. And we need the parking sign when they, moved everybody from south of Topanga Canyon, where there used to be 35 every day. They're now all up by us. I don't know what else to say, except it's dangerous. We feel unsafe, and we're not getting to use the beach that we pay for. So do we come back on Wednesday and state our case again? Yes? You're certainly welcome to come back on Wednesday. Okay, are we any closer to getting Signage, parking. We'll be talking about that then. Okay, but thank, thank you, you yeah, very that's much. That's also what this item is about. Thank you. Oh, 
Next speaker is Tina Saunders, followed by Amy Rushes, Michael Epstein. Good evening. My name is Tina Saunders. I live at 19260 PCH. I moved here 11 years ago. I came here because I had a fire at my house in Pacific Palisades. So I really understand the priority of the Woolsey fire, the Woolsey fire, but you know what? Now it's time to refocus and see what's going down on the east side of Malibu. I had to build a shed to keep my trash cans from being literally the trash all over the floor, all over the ground that I have to pick up that goes underneath my house where there are rats. My, uh, um, my uh, lights in my car were stolen um, December 28th because I guess they're good for marijuana growing. We had two incidents this last Saturday and Sunday where the police were down there. It's become such a high crime area. It is filthy. I cannot take, it's dangerous. I cannot walk down into that lifeguard station. And I know that all of you live north of us because if one of you lived in my neighborhood, you'd be doing something about it. I know you're probably bored to death by this, well, but let me tell you, I'm not it's bored, I'm just trying to do something about it. It is unconscionable that you have, yes, I get the priority of the Woolsey fire, but you have left us in such dire criminal, it's, I'm, I'm just, it's ill and I think the worst of all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Amy Rushes. Thank you, thank you. Um, I just wanna reiterate maybe some of the things that Tina said, but um, since this lot has been here, this is the parking lot on, at, at Los Tinas. So ever since this park has been here, we've had significant a rise in crime, which we never had before. At, as far as I know now, so far there's been five break-ins, which we've never had. Just this weekend, as she said, there were two altercations, but what she didn't say was uh, one of the men that stay on that lot had a, 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 gun, a um, knife, like a big knife, there was an altercation and he cut some woman's arm. And the police had to come for that. Across the street from me, which is looking right down into this parking lot, I understand a man with a machete from that lot made his way underneath the highway and up to this man's house and tried to break in the house with a machete in his hands. Um, uh, just, just yesterday, we had another altercation on this same lot that brought the police down again. I feel that we are tax-paying, law-abiding citizens. Many of us have lived in this area for decades and decades and decades. There are people here right now that worked really, really hard to be able to have a house on the water. And now we see all these people coming and invading our neighborhoods. Everything is free. We have no rights anymore at all. All the rights are going to homeless people or people that just wanna live on this lot for free. And there's nobody to help us. And so we've been dealing with this for a really long time. I've called, this, I've called the city countless times. And it just feels like We've been, we're forgotten, and one passes a buck to the other, as you probably know. Um, when Caltrans did this to us, they never took advantage of all the people. There's a lot of people that live around this parking lot, a lot of people. They never took into consideration us, and they left us totally just vulnerable. They gave us no signage, and they opened us up to having uh, people come here uh, that had ill intent, that have done nothing to be productive or help 
the community. It's been an absolute nightmare. And I wanted to call that to somebody's attention. I'm sure you probably know, but I'm just saying it anyway. Um, there's also the we Thank never Thank you, Miss Rushes. What? Thank you. You done? I'm done? It's three minute okay. per speaker. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Michael Epstein. Thank you. I'll be brief. I just wanted to say thank you that this ordinance, I think, is a great step in the right direction. The things that you guys are doing, I understand all the, not all of them, but some of the nuances with trying to control the parking and all the agencies that you have to deal with. So I would just ask that when time permits and time allows that we look at it for Zoom as well uh, to reiterate some of the same concerns that were spoken earlier. I know you guys are working on it, that you guys are addressing it. Um, the other thing that I would like to encourage, and I know the police look at it as well, the sheriffs, and they have a lot of priorities, but if we could really, really, really encourage them to use the tools they have now, which again, understood are very, very limited, to ticket the motorhomes that are parked now, whether their, their plates are expired, whether they don't have insurance. I mean, I've seen out-of-state plates in the same place for months and months and months. I don't know the laws that well, but I think you have to change your plates after you live in California for a while. Uh, I've seen car, there's motorhomes living at Zuma that don't have plates, that just have cardboard plates. I'm guessing, again, that that's some kind of violation. So I just ask you to really, really make sure that it's a priority for the sheriffs to go through every day, ticket those motorhomes for the violations that they are doing. They're, you can tell every once in a while when they do go through, it's not that frequent. It makes a huge difference. The motorhomes leave, they might only leave for three or four days, but so three or four days is, is, is better than none. So uh, thank you and anything we can do to help, we wanna help because I know you guys are working hard on it. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Epstein. Tyler, go ahead. I was just gonna make a motion uh, to conduct this second reading and move forward with this item. Do second. we have a second? Thank you, Rick. I'd like, I'd like to make a comment first, if I could. Please. Um, I wish the, uh, the Barbara, Tina, and Amy hadn't left yet, but um, we are working on this. It is extremely difficult. It's extremely complex legally, as uh, our sheriffs can attest to. We are far from ignoring it, and that's what Wednesday night is about. Um, this is a, I can't even say the word, societal disaster right now. And it, there's a, it's just really, really, unfortunately, very complicated. So um, I do hope they'll come back. I do hope other people will come. We have been exploring wherever Michael is. There you are. We are exploring every option. Um, that's become very complicated with uh, Martin versus Boise. On and on. So there's a, there's a lot there's a lot to catch up on and a lot to work on. It's going to be some interesting and difficult decisions, but they have to be made. And yes, Zuma Beach. I know people are worried about homeless people moving to Zuma. They already have. Um, I counted 15 RVs there two nights ago. 11 people, 11 vans, eight different cars, four people sleeping outside, and that was just the West End. It wasn't even all of Zuma. So um, yes, it's everywhere, and we are concerned, and we do hear you. And I'm done. Thank you. Okay. I, I think, and also just to add on to what Mikey was saying and addressing the comments that were made, this item specifically deals with part of the area and whatnot that was referenced. And to come in here and say that we're not doing anything about it is completely false and the furthest thing from the truth. So just want to set the record straight on that. Thank you, Skyler. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Oh, Amy has to get Jefferson. Okay. Okay, I think the next item polled was 3A2. That is ordinance. Somebody Again, want to say something about that? Oh, I don't Mayor, we don't have a slips. presentation, so if you can go ahead. Okay, thank you. 
think Jefferson had a comment. Yes, uh, I did pull 382. Uh, thank you. Um, after reading the letter from Craig Hill um, and his comments that we all received, and um, I was just wondering if we might add one or two of his more pertinent comments on um, on this 3A2. Um, after you read it and then you look at it in detail, uh, uh, you know, I see the, the mulch and the weed material and things like that are pretty much common sense. We can't ask our code enforcement officers to run out and t try and check on things like that. But uh, the one or two comments that I had made that I read on in here and that I reviewed in the um, uh, municipal code on the 10 foot uh, um, setback for foliage going over the driveways. That's actually a county code. I don't think he identified that, but it's actually a fire code in the county. So we might want to have staff incorporate that or at least review it. It's a pretty simple one, and it's one that we could uh, really easily do. And then the uh, with the ADUs coming forward, as because now we're looking into ADUs, the space between ADUs and uh, regular residences should probably be reviewed. I don't want to hold it up. I just wanted to know if we could make the ameliorations here because we don't want to hold this up. Um, I spoke to the city manager a couple weeks ago about this and how important it is to move forward and at least get something on the books. I understand that. Um, but I'm wondering if the council might consider those two ads to this. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank I, you, Jefferson. Go ahead, Scott. I, I concur that I think there's a couple of things that we need to clarify. Um, that we can't do those changes now, so I would make a motion to continue the item, make those corrections, and we can bring it back and vote on it. And if, do we need to go over specifically? Specific, no, okay. I appreciate that, right. Skyler, because we do want to get this on the books as per city manager's comments a couple weeks ago. I realize the immediacy of this. I don't want to for, forestall it any longer, but there's one or two items here. Thank you for understanding. Um, I do have a question. Could we get verification about the fire department requirement with that 10 foot setback? Right. The city's um, adopted the fire code, but what we'll do is we'll bring back, when we bring this back for reintroduction, we'll bring back an explanation of every single one of the points. So you'll have all of that. Okay. So thank you. So Christy. it'll come back to you for first reading again. Okay. So thank you. You just, want you just need consensus, right? We have consensus on that? Okay, cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, council members. Okay, we are on to the next uh, consent item that's been pulled, 3B5. Did you have a question on that? Uh, we Was have one pull? speaker slip. Graham Clifford. Thank you, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Thank you for having me. Um, having spent f six or seven years on the Parks and Rec Commission, I've still got parks in my DNA. <laughs> with Skylar briefly. Um, um, so when this popped up, I thought I'd look at it because then I went. I spent my lunch today um, walking uh, through Legacy Park, which I hadn't done for a while, and the benches certainly do need attention. But there's about 21 benches there within the city, within the park, which I. Had take a look, took a look at. There's 13 slats on each bench, and they're firmly rooted to the ground in a, on a metal frame. And the and the the problem is that the slats need to be re lacquered. Forty six thousand dollars to re lacquer 21 be benches with 13 slats seems seemed like a lot of money to me. Um, so um, um, Jesse and I had a quick talk about it earlier on, and he said that the company wanted to take them, take all the slats off, and take it to their workshop and redo it all, and bring them all back, and put them all back on. And that's all fine, except that I don't. I think it can be done much simpler and much quicker and easier, and save and save the, the city money, which is another one of my bugbears. So I have an off-the-wall suggestion, which is to which is to. I have the guys from the labor exchange. You know, th these these slats can be re-lacquered in place. They don't need to be removed. There's enough room between each slat to get to them and the back. And so if we, we're already giving, we're already supporting the labor exchange, the city is, in fact, it's on the, tonight's agenda. Um, 
And uh, those guys could perfectly well do this job and for a fraction of the, of, the, of the money that we would be paying to JEC Inc., whom I don't know who they are, but they're probably not even a local company, which is another bugbear of mine. There are all these companies come in from outside to do our work for us when we have plenty of people here. So that's, that was, that's my su suggestion. I know it's off the wall. I know it may not fit in with the city's legal and et, et cetera um, requirements, but I wanted to suggest it anyway, because sometimes off-the-wall suggestions can be helpful. I thought the park, by the way, looked really good. Um, I think I thought the owl perches looked great. The, 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 the bird nestings looked good. By the way, two of the benches I could not inspect because they were occupied by homeless people. One of them has a tent built completely around it. Um, so, and then when you get off the main tracks into the little tracks, which I also went into, there's pizza boxes, toilet paper, everything else in there. So it's not just the beaches, it's the park. And um, so there are, they are my comments. So I'm going to <laughs> take them for what they're worth. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. Madam Mayor? Yes. Um, as uh, Mr. Clifford's uh, guest, um, you are obligated to, whenever there's a, a public works project of a certain size, to um, publicly bid that and then um, to award the bid to the lowest responsible bidder. And that's the way that uh, California assures that you are getting, um, you're not throwing contracts to favorite um, contractors and that everything's done in a fair and, and arm's length way. So you actually don't have the option of, of doing what he's suggesting legally. Thank you, Christy. Although well-intentioned. Is there any other public comment? No. Okay, can I make a motion to approve the award and authorize the city manager to execute the construction contract with JEC? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And, and Jesse, does, wouldn't it be impossible to lacquer between the slats without removing them? Because you have to, I've done lacquering before, you have to sand it and prep it. Yeah, just, there's... Just technically, that would be really difficult, wouldn't it? It would be. Uh, I also want to correct Graham. There's actually 34 benches um, in the park and along Civic Center Way. And they're actually going to remove all of those pieces, each individual piece from each bench, sand it, put two coats of polyurethane on, and then put them back in place exactly how they are. So... It is pretty labor intensive. Um, we hear the frustration with how many bids we get and what the costs are, but. Okay. And I just want to let the council know that we also looked into the option of replacing the benches and that was actually more costly. Uh, equally, Graham, if I may, just uh, sanding is kind of toxic. So we'd have to make sure that somebody was supervising the work. Somebody had mats down on the ground that they weren't aerating all the sanding materials that come off because the lacquer becomes airborne and becomes a contamination issue. So, you know, I walked the park and thanks for checking on the bronze. Uh, and it's, it's one of those things where, yeah, maybe there's another way, but we got to move on it. Thanks, Graham. Okay. Thank you. So I made a motion to approve this. And and I think, do I we have a second? It? Yeah, I seconded. Okay, okay, sorry about that. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, the last item from consent that was pulled is 3B6. Was that, who pulled that, Jefferson? Yes, I pulled it. I wanted to make a Thank quick you. comment um, that this plan started out at Santa Monica Bay Restoration Commission, and now we have other players in the in the field that are taking monies from outside our area and doing beneficial work here in the city of Malibu. This Bluffs plan here at Zuma is going to be something that you're going to admire when you finally see the work when it's completed. And the reason I'm so interested in it is because of the um, wave uprush effect that may occur here that we can monitor now with having, without having to use city's money other than giving them the freebie to go do it. We're not actually taking money out of our coffers. Um, but we're just not going to take money in on this project. So I, uh, I endorse the project. I hope somebody will follow up on it. Maybe the local news media could use it as kind of an idea how to educate our visitors to the beach, how to treat the beach, and have respect for what we're doing there. Equally, if we monitor it, it will help us with our implementation of our plans for the future for sea level rise. This is our only barrier. 
they're, st they're doing it here in Malibu, and we're very fortunate to have this work going on. So I encourage all of you to take a look at it, and hopefully our news media will follow it. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Uh, Mayor, can I make a motion to approve this? Thank you. Do we have a second? second. All right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. So on to item 4A. May we please have a staff report? Good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, we are here this evening to um, approve, conduct the public hearing for the use of the Community Development Block Grant funds for fiscal year 2020-2021. Um, we always do this in advance of the upcoming year. Uh, in years past, we've received around $46,000 of CDBG funding. This year, that number is project projected to go up to almost 65,000. Every year, um, there's a limit on how much of that funding can be used for services. The bulk of it has to be used for capital projects, um, and only 15% uh, can be used for service projects. Historically, the city has granted those funds to the Malibu Community Labor Exchange, and that is the recommendation here. Um, this year, uh, the recommendation is to use $20,000 of the funds for the labor exchange. In addition, um, LA County uh, Development Authority is um, looking at ways to help Malibu spend some of our dollars because it's been historically so difficult for us to spend these things on capital projects. There are very limited things we can spend it on, and one of the things we're looking to do in the future is to develop the permanent trailer for the labor exchange once Santa Monica College has completed its renovation of the satellite campus. Um, so in discussions with CDBG folks, uh, we've come up with uh, funding for about $44,000 to pay for preparedness equipment for public safety power shutoffs for seniors. If you'll remember in the past, we were able to use funding to purchase emergency supply backpacks, again, for seniors. These funds are typically used to help um, either homeless or sen seniors. Um, the labor exchange typically is working with the homeless population. Um, seniors are the other sort of easily eligible um, group. And so that's what we're looking to do here today um, and ask for you to authorize uh, adopt resolution number 20-04 to approve the use of 20,000 in CDBG funding for the Malibu Community Labor Exchange and 44,000 for preparedness equipment um, in the event of PSPS shutoffs. Thank you, Lisa. Um, Mayor, may I make a motion to conduct this hearing and adopt this resolution adopting the said use of these funds? I would like to second that motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. We are on to item 6A. May we please have a staff report? Good evening, Mayor Fair and Council. My name is Christine Shen. I'm here to talk about the Enhanced Dumpster Enforcement Program and the Locking Bin Ordinance. This item addresses the unsanitary trash areas in Malibu. The desired outcome is to improve the cleanliness of these trash areas, prevent the presence of rodents, and discourage the use of rodenticides. The current municipal code requires that solid waste container lids be closed at all times and trash areas kept in a clean and sanitary condition. If not, the city has the option to require a locking lid. For your background, on June 24th, council directed staff to bring back an ordinance to require 24-7 locking lids by June 2020 and implement the Enhanced Dumpster Enforcement Program. 
Between July and October, staff researched other cities' solid waste codes, drafted the locking lid ordinance, and continued outreach for the enhanced dumpster program. As no city has required 24-7 locking dumpster lids, staff drafted the locking lid ordinance using the code from a city in Bear Country. Once drafted, the city attorney worked with staff to review the ordinance, and this draft ordinance was brought to the Environmental Sustainability Subcommittee meeting on November 14th. After discussing with community members and affected businesses, the subcommittee recommended staff bring two ordinance options to council, which I will go over shortly. Following the direction from council, staff is currently implementing the Enhanced Dumpster Enforcement Program. This program stresses education and enforcement through more frequent communications with food service establishments, which are the largest producers of waste. ESD monitors and issues warnings and corrections through our Clean Bay restaurant inspections, follow-up inspections, and complaints from the public. If a business remains non-compliant, it, it is referred to code enforcement, which initiates the citation process. As mentioned, staff uses its Clean Bay restaurant inspections to monitor the trash areas per existing code. The city has been part of the Clean Bay restaurant program since 2008. This requires the three environmental program staff to inspect each restaurant twice a year. With 60 restaurants in the city, over 120 inspections are conducted per year. And the goal of these inspections um, is to protect water quality and our environment by reducing pollution. So the environmental program inspectors look at the business's dumpster and waste handling practices, outdoor cleaning practices, grease handling, education, and outreach. And I brought an inspection form for to show that the criteria for dumpster areas include making sure that the area is free of trash on the floor, on the walls, free of leakage, and free of liquids, and that the lids are closed. During these inspections, staff speaks directly with business representatives about the importance of keeping dumpster areas clean and lids closed to reduce the use of rodenticides. Since fall 2018, the city has sent letters to businesses and through waste haulers, bill stuffers, conducted over 200 inspections, designed and distributed signs that encourage best practices such as breaking down boxes and closing lids. We've sent notices to comply and referred two shopping centers to code enforcement. As a result of these actions, facilities with dumpster area corrections have decreased by 5% from 2018 to 2019. And staff expects this number to further decrease since the signs and bill stuffers were delivered after the last inspection season. The second part of Council's June 24th direction was to bring back a locking bin ordinance. Before this Council meeting, staff drafted and brought the locking bin ordinance to the Environmental Sustainability Subcommittee on November 14th. During the subcommittee's discussion with community members and affected businesses, concerns were raised about penalizing the good players of the city for the poor housekeeping of a minority. As a result, the subcommittee recommended bringing two ordinance options to city council. Option one seeks to penalize repeat violators by amending the code to specify when the city would require locking lids on, on these bins. For example, the code could be amended so that the city requires a business to lock its bin after it receives three notices from environmental program staff within a year or after one gross violation. And these are just examples. Um, that could be firmed up depending on your direction. Um, option two amends the code to require 24 locking lids for all businesses. And the next slides will go over the impacts for both options. So the city doesn't have a franchise agreement with any waste hauler, therefore it does not have control over the fees for these locking lids. Our waste haulers have estimated that there will be a one-time fee of around $100 for welding the rolling lock bar to a bin, and then there will be a monthly reoccurring fee up to $10 per pickup per bin 
for servicing the locked bins. For example, a business with six day a week pickup will pay up to an additional $240 per month for each bin that it owns. There are over 200 businesses in Malibu. Option one tar targets repeat violators, so only a small portion of the customers would be subject to increased fees. Option two requires locking lids for all businesses, so all 200 would be subject to increased fees, and that includes offices, retail, and restaurants. Additionally, a portion of the city is part of the Malibu Garbage, garbage Disposal District, which is managed by LA County and tax-based. Due to the county's fee structure, the cost of the business's increase is going to be, is anticipated to be passed down to the district's residential customers as well, impacting all 251 Malibu Garbage Disposal District customers. Here is a summary of all the impacts for the two options, which includes businesses, city resources, and traffic. Um, we already discussed business impacts for city resources. Planning and implementation of a dumpster ordinance update wasn't included in the work plan and will require for option one, 15 hours per month. For option two, a minimum of 60 hours a month for the first six months, followed by approximately 30, sorry, 30 for ongoing. And these hours include staff time for environmental programs, media, and code enforcement to properly inform Malibu customers of the ordinance and the associated fee increases, as well as conducting follow-up and enforcement. For traffic, due to the additional time needed to service locked bins, in option two, the haulers expect to add trucks and drivers for each trash and recycling route. Staff is seeking City Council's direction on which ordinance to bring back for its first reading. Option one would amend the municipal code to specify when the city would require locking lids on dumpsters for businesses that receive multiple violations. Option two would amend the municipal code to require locking lids on dumpsters at all times for businesses. Thank you and staff and our solid waste haulers UWS and Waste Management are available for any questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have several public speaker slips. And if you don't mind uh, coming close to the front um, so that we don't lose a lot of time in between speakers. First is Graham Clifford, followed by Jimmy Chavez, followed by, I believe it's James Roberson. Thank you. So, good evening again. Um, I originally came to recommend option two without um, as being the obvious choice here, because if you if you leave bins open, there's going to be problems, and so it's just easier to close them all for one, at once and for all and be done with it. However, having heard the the staff's um, presentation, it's a bit more complicated. I didn't realize the ex the extent of the fees that these people were going to be hit with. So, um, I, you know, I just don't know. I think that, you know, I get, Ralph's is my local market, so to get to Ralph's, I go up the back behind, the, behind all the shops and things and come out the, that way. I never go through the front. So I get to see the bins a lot, and I know that I know it's a major problem, and if, there's, if people are given the option of leaving their bin open or locking it, they'll leave it open. That's just, the, that's just life. So, um, I, I don't know, I, I'm thinking on my feet here, is there anything that the city can do to help the people who are small business owners who would probably be the ones would, that would comply the most regularly to, to help them with these extra fees? Or, or um, it, you know, I belong to a homeowners association as well, and we have locking bins, and it doesn't take, it doesn't seem to me for the trucks to take any more time to, to unlock the bins and empty them than it does regularly. So I don't quite know what that's all about either. But having said that, it's in your hands. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham. The next speaker is, I believe it's Jimmy Chavez, followed by James Roberson, followed by Gabriel Chavez. Evening, Mayor and Council. Um, 
want to start by just saying thank you for your commitment to environmental sustainability. It's something that we're very passionate about at Duke's. Um, organic waste recycling, the elimination of single-use plastics, the conversion to renewable energy in whatever capacity are all things that have not been um, positive for our bottom line, but they're something that we're very passionate about and that we support strongly. So with that in mind, um, I'd like to say that we would advocate for option one that wouldn't enforce um, that wouldn't put costs onto every business, just the violators within the city of Malibu since it takes a great deal of energy, training, and education to keep your trash areas clean. And we feel strongly that we do a good job, as do many other businesses in Malibu, and shouldn't have to pay the additional costs um, to enforce that. And it takes, um, obviously, to care about the ocean, you have to care about your environment in order to implement these types of systems. And we should expect that from all of our businesses here. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is James Roberson, followed by Gabriel Chavez, followed by Steve Lee. <coughs> Hi, I'm James Robertson. I am also representing a local business. I am a manager over at Nobu down the street. Um, <coughs> and I feel fairly strongly about this issue, seeing as though we put, I personally, uh, being the back of house manager, put a lot of effort and energy into maintaining clean garbage areas and generally also trying to um, you know, be ecologically minded in any capacity that I can, uh, much like Jimmy was mentioning in terms of reducing our water use. We've implemented new uh, defrosters that save like thousands of dollars literally off of our monthly water bill um, using compostable cutlery and serving ware for our family meal, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I could go on and on, but uh, this is something that we take very seriously. And, uh, and above and beyond the simple costs, I just feel that it's fairly illogical to jump all the way to requiring locking bins and I have some experience living in various places where I've seen locking bins um, and to your average passerby that prevents them from throwing away anything that they may want to try to you know, toss in the garbage as they're walking their dog and they have a, a bag, as they're finishing a beverage, whatever it may be. Um, and also in tandem, not to kind of go off on tangents, but with a lot of the homelessness that's also a a large scale uh, point of concern. They create garbage as well. If we have all the garbages, you know, be they dumpsters or public garbage cans, et cetera, et cetera, which likely wouldn't be locked, but either way, if they're all locked, they're still gonna leave their garbage right in front of the dumpster. It's not gonna go inside. And that seems to be what we're trying to prevent. Um, <clears throat> and so I think efforts could be better placed in terms of trying to enforce the current code. Um, I believe the statistics were that this past year it was 40% 40, 40 or so, and the year previous it was 45% compliance, which is pretty abysmal in the grand scheme when it comes to something of this nature. You know, your roughly 50% compliance is it's not really, in my mind, um, a call to action in terms of reevaluating the codes and the policies. It's simply a question of enforcement. Um, and were code to be more uh, rigorously enforced, I think there would be much higher degrees of compliance and a lot of the issues and consequences of poorly maintained garbage areas could be avoided. Um, so, so yeah, I strongly urge people to consider the kind of grand scope of embarking upon option two if that might be their their preference. So thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Gabriel Chavez, followed by Steve Lee, and then Keon Shulman. Uh, you have seven minutes. Good evening, Council. Thank you again. Um, I do like to start these meetings off by reminding uh, Council and city staff and anybody else, um, Universal Waste Systems is a for-profit service-based company. So whichever way you decide, we are going to work hard to get the job done and to provide the service um, that we can. Um, with that being said, I'm also, I work with on a consulting level as well as an advocate for my customers. And three of my customers, Nobu, Dukes, um, and Malibu Country Mart are here tonight. And I'll, let me correct myself, I should apologize. 
there's five of my customers here. We also service Station House 72, and we also service Zuma J. Zuma J's is a small businessman, and he manages to operate his trash areas without being in violation. And he does that with best, pra best management practices. Um, I'm not exactly sure how you do it, but I go, you're on PC, <laughs> you're on PCH, you're exposed to all the elements, the homeless, the public, the beachgoers, everybody. You do not have a locking lid on your bin, and your area is always clean and litter free. Your bin is never overstuffed, um, so it can be done right, and that's a perfect example of it. Now, with regards to Nobu and Dukes and Malibu Country Mart, who are here tonight, who are represented here, these businesses go to the extremes to do things right. They spend thousands, and I'm saying thousands of dollars, on trash every month. So part of what I do is try to help them reduce those costs, maintain those costs, look for areas where we can even cut costs. I don't look for areas where we can increase and raise costs. Going with option two, or option one, I got them confused, with the mandatory, that will increase costs. Um, specifically, someone, an account like Malibu Country Mart, they have 15 bins on their premises. They are maximized in space. They're maximized on their service level. They get picked up six days a week. If they could, they'd get picked up seven days a week. They get holiday service. They pay extra for that. Nobu gets holiday service as well. And I don't know if you've ever seen their parking lot after New Year's Eve on New Year's Day. They do quite a bit of business, which generates tax revenue for the city as well. We don't want that to go away. They pay us to come in and clean it up on the holiday. Same thing with Dukes. So the solution is not to mandate them to spend more money. The solution is let's work together. Let's find programs, which we already do. Thank you. And that's the solution. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Steve Lee and then Keon Shulman. Good evening, Mayor, Council, staff. Um, here to speak upon the, the locking bin ordinance. And again, as a collaborator with our businesses in Malibu, our goal is to provide them the service that they need and to accommodate the city's mandates. Um, again, there's a best management practice that can be used when you're working with your customers. And I think that's um, in our best interest to target those best management practices, ensure that customers that do it right aren't penalized by an additional fee. Um, we need to, to know that these locking bins, they could serve a purpose for sure. Um, will they eliminate um, trash from falling out of a bin and into an enclosure floor? Likely not, not if the service isn't right and the service levels aren't proper for that business or what that commodity is produced through that, that uh, customer. So a locking lid will have to be used and obviously if there's inspections and it's mandated, then they're going to be forced to use it. It may not solve every problem considering uh, their volume or their service levels. So that's something that we need to think about. Um, again, either way, we're here to serve, no matter which way is, it, it goes, we will accommodate our customers uh, based on the decision that you make this evening. I'll give some time back. Thank you. All right, Keon Shulman, um, l let me just make sure your um, uh, other uh, audience members are still here so that you get your seven minutes. Pat Healy, here. Judy Villablanca, Lance Simmons, Keegan Gibbs. Okay, that's it, thank you. Thank you, good evening, Mayor Ferris, City Council members and staff.
I want to thank the staff for the three well-written letters sent out to the business community last September, recognizing that controlling food waste by closing dumpsters is essential to, to controlling rodents in commercial, business, and school settings where dumpsters are used. The letters confirmed the decision by the city council vote back in June 2019 that all dumpsters in commercial areas must have lockable lids by June 2020 to be used at all times. We just surveyed many locales in Malibu just last weekend. There's a normal fluctuation in dumpsters from day to day. However, thank you for your attempt, but there is no change and there has made no significant difference on the ground. Several of the Clean Bay City certified restaurants for 2019 have been the worst offenders for trash control. Also, there are several locations with poison bait boxes right next to their open dumpsters. Cumbersome and frequent multiple warnings just doesn't work. Education alone doesn't work. Two, two visits a year doesn't work. A straightforward 24-7 dumpster lidlock ordinance is simple to implement and enforce with clear, strong penalties. Malibu has severe problems with the dumpsters. They still have ill-fitting or warped lids that cannot be closed to block rodent access. Sanitary, safe, sealable dumpsters are necessary for the health and safety of our own citizens and workers. All the 10 surrounding cities that I've worked in have the same problem with delinquent dumpsters and poison bait boxes everywhere. Malibu's dumpsters are almost all deficient. No change from enhanced uh, enforcement. Staff report notes that not all businesses should be punished for poor solid waste practices of much smaller group. This is false, this is very, uh, it, it is untrue, and the very few obey the existing code. Clean Bay certified are supposed to be the best. The requirements are not fulfilled. Trash bin lids are not closed. These are the requirements and they are not closed. Here are some photos from last uh, weekend that I just took to keep everything, even though I've done this multiple times through the years, showing the terrible problems we have here. Malibu High School, five open dumpsters, lids next to the ball fields and boys and girls clubs where they just had some rodent issues. Point to May Village, pavilions. Thank you, Waste Management, for replacing the lids on many of the dumpsters. However, there is, uh, there's a, uh, there's, they, they, they still have this crack in the middle that provides rodent access. Point to May Village, other than pavilions, this is universal waste system. They still have unchanged, defective dumpsters, gooey, rusted, warped, that are the norm and are a health hazard. These Clean Bay restaurants that were certified below use these dumpsters right there. Is that, is that, is that considered a safe, sealable dumpster that you gave awards to? Here we go. Zuma Beach Plaza, another Clean Bay certified. Uh, the, the dumpsters are constantly overstuffed, overflowing, uh, another Clean Bay certified. Here we go, Malibu Village, Clean Bay certified marmalade. That is, a, that is a dumpster that I took pictures of back in 2019, even though I just took that last, last weekend. Clean Bay certified mar mar marmalade. Marmalade, is, that is one of their dumpsters that they're using, and this is supposed to be okay? Universal has got to clean up their act. Malibu Village behind Chipotle. Chipotle is a constant bane of, 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 of rats and mice and exposed trash. They never close their dumpsters. Malibu Village, again, universal. This is a great universal com company here. Huge gaps in the middle, rodent holes in the middle. They have never done anything to replace their dumpsters. Little Beach House in Malibu, Clean Bay certified. This has got to be one of the most filthy uh, dumpster areas that I, have, uh, that I have seen since they have moved in there. Their dumpsters are, that, that's an open dumpster to the left. They're overstuffed and they're flowing with the trash all over. Nobu also has uh, overstuffed dumpsters also. Behind Malibu Colony Mark, Starbucks, another Clean Bay certified restaurant. That, that, that's an open dumpster right there with the lid pins against the wall, and this is the inside. 
they, they never close their dumpsters there either, behind Malibu Kitchen. Look at this dumpster on the right. This is universal again. That is a warped lid. These are the, these are the, 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 the dumpsters they are providing us. Malibu Lumberyard, Clean Bay Certified, Cafe Habana. These, these, the, Cafe Habana has been one of the worst offenders since they have moved in here. That is three open dumpsters right there on the left. On the right, you have the, uh, the organic that is also open. They never close their dumpsters. Clean Bay Certified again. Again, Carbon Beach Center, Universal, overstuffed. For uh, uh, trash flowing all over. For, that's where PC Greens used to be. McDonald's overstuffed, trash falling out. Behind Marmalade Cafe, another clean base certified restaurant. That is an open dumpster there to the left, and that's all the trash that's in back of that. Birds fly down, rats are in there. I talk to the ground managers, and they say this is this is absolutely disgusting, and they need help. Point to me, professional center. Two lids pinned against the wall there. Open area trash. Nothing has been done. Below Malibu City Hall, Miramar building there. Rat holes, uh, gaps in the middle. She can't, you can't close these dumpsters. Malibu Colony Plaza, Ralph's Market, overstuffed. They are constantly overstuffed. Trash flowing all over, rodents. In back of Malibu Colony Plaza, again, clean base certified. All those restaurants were certified, and they're all filthy. All, all the dumpsters are open. There's open trash behind the entire colony. There's another overstuffed dumpster for you. Sunset Restaurant, clean base certified. Rat holes, uh, exposed uh, um, areas there. They, they're also overstuffed and overflowing. Urgent, this is what we're looking for, urgent care locked. They're already locked there. Malibu, are, uh, um, the outfitters are locked. Pavilions are locked. Provena Pinnacles are locked. So um, the city's existing Thank organs you. that dumpsters have Dion. closed. Thank you. That is it. Oh, my God. Okay. It's, it's really important that we go back to the 24-7 lid lock. We have one more speaker, Joel Thank Schulman. Thank you. Okay, yeah, I have a few, few slides also. Oh, I can't see that. Okay, yeah, um, just want to go over the history of, of, of this uh, decision-making process and try to understand why we are in this familiar um, realm of going in circles. Uh, this started in November of 2017 when I think it was Skyler um, re re responded to our request to look into this, that we really should have locked dumpsters. In January of 2018, uh, Skyler and Jefferson um, decided to uh, have the city council consider the ordinance, including dumpster lid, dumpster covers and locks shall be used at all times, the red, the red uh, type there. That was a, the decision. And we waited and waited for the ordinance to be written up and it didn't happen. Instead, the Environmental Sustainability Department took it on, uh, on their own to just ignore it and throw it away and came up with their enhanced dumpster enforcement plan. Uh, completely ignoring what the subcommittee had decided. Going to June 24th, just last June, uh, after several other rounds, again, completely clear city council decision. Staff write up an ordinance to require dumpsters uh, lids to be locked 24 seven by June 2020. Everybody remember that? It was just in June. Completely ignored, thrown away, and uh, we had an environmental sustainability subcommittee meeting in November which went right back in a circle, back to uh, you know, a couple of years before. And here we are again. So, so it's only been two years, you know, we're used to, we, 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 we don't quit. So we'll see you three years from now if necessary, if that's how long it takes, no problem. Um, uh, the, the problem is, is that well, this is really great stuff that Christine is doing. I mean, signs, letters, inspections, yes, absolutely the way to go. Three out of 60 Clean Bay restaurants supposedly improved from one year to the next, that's, what, that's it. And as Keon just said, did they really improve? Uh, they look like as bad as any other place. So the main issue is, as you can see, it is not working. 
this enhanced dumpster uh, enforcement program and the Clean Bay program together are just not working. What we need is real simplicity, we'll make, which will make it cheaper, which is a simple rule. Dumpsters must be locked. And not three or four warnings in a year when you only check every other, every six months. Do like Boulder, Colorado did to stop the bears from getting in. Right on their website, Boulder, Colorado says, no warnings. First offense, $100. Second offense, $250. Third offense, uh, $500. And it says, no warnings. You get no warnings. OK, we can give one warning. I don't, that's OK. Um, but so why is this so, is it, I mean, when we talk to people, like, they're shocked. I mean, dumpsters are not supposed to actually prevent rodents. They're just supposed to be used to haul trash out, apparently. So um, the cost uh, given you. in the staff report, if you do the math, is $37 a month for the subset of garbage disposal district customers. Thank you, Joel. And that's, that's it. I question the cost estimates. Two minutes, please. Thank you. Uh, okay, well. Okay. And the good dumpsters right there. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, do we have any council comments? Yes, there, that's the end of public speakers on that item. Sure. Uh, so I would just say that we did, uh, Jefferson and I conducted the, the meeting uh, with our environmental sustainability subcommittee uh, about this. We received some comments from some of the members of the public here and some others. Um, we thought it would be the right thing to present or have staff come back with these two options. Um, on one hand, there was, I think, at least for me, sort of this notion of do we want to punish people that are good operators? I think the frustrating part in that is that it's hard to find somebody that's a consistent good operator of how they deal with their trash. Um, it seems like the ones that have the most success are the ones that have the locking bins, uh, pavilions, pinnacle, and I think one of the other uh, urgent care. Urgent care. Um, so I, uh, my, my inclination, you know, I mean, I, I think it's important for us to look at the cost and hear from our business owners. Um, and I think it's not, there's no solution that everyone's going to be like cheerful and happy for. Because on one hand, we have, you know, people that are concerned about the environment that want them to be locked all the times. So on the other hand, we have business owners that are expressing their concerns with costs and staff time, et cetera, et cetera. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there, and that's where well, that's why it came to you in the two different options, even though we had said that we wanted it to be locked all the time. Thank you, Skyler. Anybody else? Uh, I'm interested in hearing what Jefferson has to say. I think he's the guy with a lot of environmental cred, certainly more than me, and well as being a local business owner, so he's the one who's going to have to feel the impact, and he can give us that perspective. And I'd like to hear from him first. Uh, thank you for that endorsement, Rick. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, when Skylar and I had looked at this, we did have the vendors there, and I thank them for their participation. Um, they brought us some information that we had not seen before about the bear lids, which seemed to be part of the antidote to some of the issues that we may be having here in the city. So the bear lids are in some of the pictures presented by Keon and Joel, and we thought that that should be something that should be brought forward as part of the the system, replacing those bins that already have problems with their tops, whether the rats have chewed through them, or the employees that operate them are pressing the lids down at one corner to compress the boxes because they're too lazy to stomp on the boxes or crush the boxes. It takes an extra 30 seconds. So when we debate this among ourselves as council members, we're, of course, aware of the acute needs of some of these businesses and then the other businesses that are practicing best management behaviors. And that's where we'll probably have our, our issue here is when we head down that road, adding the cost to a burger, not knocking Dukes or Nobu, but a burger or whatever commodity you're selling, the price goes up when your cost goes up. And so that limits your market and then that li limits your profitability one way or another as a business, you have to either absorb it or raise the prices. So that's the debate we'll have as we go forward. However, there were a couple of uh, maintenance things that we probably should have discussed. One of them was some of the timings uh, of some of the announcements. And I appreciate the, uh, the participation by the public. 
So here we are, and where we're headed is we'll have to make the decisions ourselves on whether it's option one or option two. I will make the observation on my own part about how to get people to behave better. So if you go over to Nobu, which I did in last week, the area is much cleaner than a neighbor, but I'm not going to say the names. And you sit there and you walk from one to the other and you go, look, Nobu, I'd eat there. I could afford it, but you go next door and it's not the same habit. And um, I don't know where we go with this. There are good players and there are poor players. And that's what I like to hear from the rest of the council about is where we head this way because without some enforcement and without the potential for fines, if we don't fine, we can't enforce. We have to pay our enforcement officers to go out there. Comes out of Reva's money for staff. So with a fine, maybe they'll get behind taking better care of their dumpsters and doing the proper business behavior. So getting the fine can also pay back code enforcement. So it's a big circle. And uh, that's my first comment. Thank you. Thank you, Jefferson. Mikey? Sure. Um, thanks to all the speakers. Uh, it's really appreciate you showing up. and sharing your stories. Um, I, I think the problem is here, I mean, first of all, if we went for option one, how would we differentiate? How do you do that? What's the mechanism there? How do you differentiate I mean, staff changes, cultures in business change? I've, you know, I had four dumpsters at my business in Santa Monica, and I remember going through all the evolutions to where we ended up with locking lids because that's the only thing that would work. Um, and learning how to do best trash management practices. Um, I, I think what's kind of clear is that ultimately, really, for every city in this area, and I suppose many more places, we should all have, I like the bare ones. Those are good. They're all over Mammoth. They're, they work great, and you can't overstuff them. They're good. Uh, but we should have trash cans like that. It should just be the norm because it's very clear from my own experience going behind the shopping centers and looking too, which I have, it's it's disgusting. It's horrible. And with us really making an effort here to ban rodenticides and poisons, we have to have best practices. Um, I, so I think this is kind of a, Jefferson alluded to it, and I've noticed it's just in home trash. It's a cultural issue. I know in my family, I'm the only one who does the trash because no one else does it right, and it's a mess. It drives me nuts. I'm out there recycling everything and cutting stuff up, but I'm that guy. So I get it, and a lot of people aren't. I go to cities back east, uh, Cooperstown, New York, where my sister lives. Everything has to go in a clear bag, and they inspect every single one when they pick it up. You can't put... Every there's different colored trash cans. There's like four of them. This is a little like conservative upstate New York town. This is not a liberal bastion of environmentalism, and they've been doing this for ten years. Where I just think our culture is wrong on this whole issue, and changing culture is hard. Changing habits hard. So I I really feel for the people that are doing it right. I really appreciate the people that are doing it right. Thank you. That is awesome. I mean, that, just a lot of respect. But ultimately, I think we're just kicking the can down the road if we don't head towards some version of a locking lid. I really got my eyes open with the, the bare one. I mean, those are great. And I know the condo I had in Mammoth had those. And you know what? There was no trash anywhere. And when they had the old ones, there was. There was trash everywhere until they changed to those. So that that's kind of where I'm heading because I don't know any other way to to fix this, and I, and I do feel for the people that are doing it right now, but I don't have a better answer. So, Mikey, if you don't mind me asking, did you say that uh, at your place in Santa Monica, you actually did use locking lids? We ended up there. We, yeah, we had to. Like, it took. You know, I had the business almost thirty years, but yeah, it evolved, and we had every version of warped lids and. So how was that? Stuff. I mean, just walk us through it. Somebody who, who was it? Was it doable? Yeah, but it was a cultural change. It was. We we finally built an enclosure. We spent the money and built an enclosure. Um, so 
it was it was a combination of animals, rats, people. Everything wanted to get and employees that were lazy. Every version of everything happened. We finally got to where we just really learned how to do it right, and that's how you were trained, and nobody questioned it. But it took us a lot of years to figure that out. And so, actually, using padlocks on it, though. Yeah, we actually. Um, Yes, and we also had an area we locked the area with uh, like mesh fencing so you couldn't get in there. So, yeah. Um, I had a question for either Gabe or the gentleman from Waste Management, which was do you guys offer? I mean, I know that you, the bins that uh, Keon and Joel had shown that were the bear style bins, those are offered in areas probably not necessarily in this area, but um, and maybe something for the, the would, would, can you get those here? Yes, we can get those lids, and our current bins can, they can re be retrofitted to fit our existing bins. We can just swap them out. Um, so it would be some labor, not as labor intensive as adding locking lids um, to the bins. But one thing I do want to point out, as disturbing as those pictures were that Keon showed in a presentation, you need to recognize how many of those bins have locking bars on them. They're not being used. So locking bins aren't necessarily the answer. It's the training, it's the staff, it's who's using those bins and those lock bars. That's what it comes down to. And like Dukes and Nobu and these people, it's, they've spent countless hours and times with training. Training with, I've been included with their staff. Dukes had 130 people in their restaurant we did a big training program with all of their staff, and that sent a message to their staff how important it is. So it's about training your people to do it the right way Thank and you. enforcing it. Thank you. Um, you know, maybe something that council would look at would, and I don't even know where, how this would fit in here. I didn't really think about it to know it, but have the option of saying you can have a locking bid or the bear bin uh, related lid. Maybe that would be you know, a way to go that would probably, because, you know, there's people that have issues with unlocking things or, you know, whatnot, and you'd either have a, you know, a metal lid that you could lift up that's not able to, to, to stay up. Um, that could be a solution, maybe, that doesn't. I know that there's, I would imagine there's added cost if you have a bear related thing very similar to having a locking lid. Yes, okay. So the costs would still be there, but we would be, solving the same problem and giving the the business owner two different options. Okay, thank you, Skylar. I have some things to say about this. First of all, my blood pressure is going up because this whole thing's making me mad. Um, there's a lot of non-compliance, obviously, um, and it's worse than I think anybody would have imagined, and I want to thank Keon for personally going around and taking all those pictures just one week ago. Not a year ago, not six months ago, one week ago. So, um, yeah, many of the restaurants and grocery stores are clearly exhibiting a need for training. And I'm glad to hear that Dukes did what they did. That's a start. Um, but what that tells me is that enforcement actually begins at the business. Because if they're not managing and training their people, then somehow it's falling to the lowest common denominator, and that's a very bad place, and that's where a lot of those businesses are right now. Um, this to me is so simple. If people would, if the business owners and managers would follow the law, act responsibly, show some stewardship for the environment, uh, be a good neighbor, have common sense. None of this would be necessary. We all would have been home by now. And that's not right. Um, but you know, the city is already stretched thin. And we do have a lot going on in the way of enforcement. Um, I wish we could double, triple, quadruple uh, our enforcement staff, but I don't think that's in the cards with our budget. Um, I'm 
I'm really unhappy about the businesses that think it's okay to do this, that think it's okay to just throw their trash next to the bin or behind it or on top of it. And business owners and managers, whoever's listening, or if you watch this next week, shame on you. Why don't you do the right thing? So that really does make me mad, and I'm like Mikey. I'm the, the recycling fixer at my house. I'm the one flattening the boxes and cutting off the gluey tape things and all of that. Why? Not because it's so fun, but because it's the right thing to do. And that way, it has a chance of going where it needs to go. So, um, I like Skylar's idea. Um, the bare containers don't leave a lot of margin for error. Um, and we've all seen them. Uh, Boulder, that's a big crackdown. I didn't know about that. No warnings. Um, I don't know if we're there yet. I, in my mind, I am, but I don't know if we're there as a council. Um, and yeah, we need cultural change. It, you can't look at a magazine. You can't get the paper. You can't read anything anywhere without seeing how young people are outraged at what the world has come to. It, particularly with the environment. So here we are, we're the grown-ups, supposed to be setting the good example. And there's definitely room for improvement. I was horrified by those photos. And those are our local businesses. And many of them are local residents. Not naming names, but some of the bad offenders our local people, and I'm very, very sorry to see that. So um, we're gonna have to try to figure out where to go with this. And, um, okay, Skylar, thank um, you. I had another question, uh, maybe for Gabe, would be how, what, what's the timeline on you guys changing out these, uh, the dumpsters in Malibu uh, for the commercial customers to have locking lids and or bear related lids? Um, it will depend somewhat on which you wanted to go with the uh, the bare lids or the locking lids. Locking lids materials available, um, but more labor intensive. The bare lids, uh, I think Mike uh, Smith from Waste Management told us at the subcommittee meeting that uh, he was he had to have that shipped from I think Alaska. The example that he brought at the subcommittee meeting. So they're not as readily available. Um, but again, when you start getting into the mix of ordering and getting them swapped out, things do start to pick up momentum. Okay, thank you. Um, well, I think um, I would put forth that we look at option two, requiring them to be locked at all times or to have a, a bare style lid. I don't know the proper language for doing that, but I would be okay with having those two options out there. I think that, I don't know if we can pull up the photos. I think, Joel, you had them at the end of your I know, but, um, or if Alex, you're in cyberspace or somebody in there, there's a... So we can show people watching at home. You can pull up the... Joel, do you, or Alex? It's coming. Just let me say briefly, I mean, the Boulder website defines a bear-proof dumpster. Okay. Can you, Joel, would you mind, if you don't mind, talking about that bear lid and or locking? What's your comment? That's a good question. You know, I, I really hadn't, uh, what, what, um, what do you think of the, uh, the, the, yeah. The, 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 this does not stop unauthorized no, sorry, you, access. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. This does not stop unauthorized access or overstuffing. That whole lid can be lift up. Okay, so you can lift up that whole lid. What, what, bear, what this bare lid does, it prevents that crack in the middle. All of our dumpster lids have this crack in the middle that, they, uh, that allows for rodent access. That bare lid is a solid lid, so that solves the crack in the middle, all right? But it doesn't solve unauthorized access or overstuffing. So you, we could, I prefer, with the better idea is to request that the bare lids uh, be put on all of our dumpsters. That'll eliminate that crack, and they, they, are, they could be uh, locked after that. The bare lids can be locked. Thank so you. we we get bare lids and a locking ordinance. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, well, I think if you look at the, the photo that's referenced here, the, the three options of what appear to be like a regular style sized um, dumpster with, with one with two opening lids, one with one, um, would probably, I don't know how to put that language into an ordinance, but that's the, what I would The double door is a little more expensive. I'm and sure, but I'm just want to be clear that that's what I'm referencing when I'm talking about that. Um, and I think that they should have the option of doing that lid or the the locking lid straight bar across um, and that they were required to be locked at all times um, if they go with the bar option. Except isn't, for, you know, obviously. Isn't the one on the lower left uh, like a sort of a bare one and there a locking bar there at the bottom too? So you can do both? Is that what I'm saying? Yeah, no, no. That's the, gr the green you one. You can do be, be locked, but I think that the, the middle part is on that one you can always open. Um, and I think that there should be language in the ordinance that somehow captures the like lid left open thing, um, you know, to, to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, and then I don't know what, uh, Christy, any kind of uh, violation structures in place for this or that's just regular policy. And I would say that you get, uh, you know, like one, one pass on the warning letter of your bins not locked or left open, and then after that, it's a citation. Yeah, the enforcement starts because a, a warning is a, is a legal way for the city to come back and say, we warned you, and you didn't, you know, follow our prescription for fairness, and here is your penalty. And that's how we can, not that we want to promote a larger bureaucracy, but the Code Enforcement Division has to, you know, maybe it becomes revenue neutral when they say, hey, I don't want to fine you, but the second, third, fourth time without doing the right thing, we will fine you. And that's what's going to drive these people to do the right things. I just wanted to also mention that Christine did a great deal of work on this. I wanted to reach out to her and give her a high five. Thank you. Um, one thing I found out in my own uh, research, I don't know if I have to say it that way, but there's a, a, a a definition called pyramiding of trash, pyramiding. So when you have these uh, bare lids, which are also used in fishing industry areas, um, with the double lids, which are more expensive, you have fewer pyramiding issues than the single lid in the center. But the single lid is easier to operate. So pyramiding is when the trash piles up inside the dumpster and it comes to a, a pinnacle or a top and it's not distributed. Somebody has to push it sideways one way or another. Those are kinds of things that can be put on the front of the dumpster in the way the decals are, because I noticed some of the dumpster operators are doing things in Spanish now, and I appreciate you that, for that and give you a thumbs up for putting it in Spanish as well. I appreciate that. Okay. Do I have support on going forward with some rendition of that, or does somebody want to change it or no, or I don't know? I, I I, I support that, yes. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm kind of inclined to uh, listen to my business owners and uh, if they're comfortable with that. Well, I, I think that. you know, what, what's been proposed makes sense, and I, I do think we need to put a fine schedule too because anything like a business, if your alarm goes off, you have one warning, it goes off again for no reason because you're not taking care of it, they start fining you because it's a nuisance. Same, it's the same thing. It's, it, this, is clearly a public health issue. It's disgusting. Yes, I, that's to me that would make sense. So we're talking about locking or bear. We're talking about locking or bear by this summer. Implementing something by the summer and allowing the vendors to procure the uh, bear lids, whichever one they choose to option for. They start replacing them on the ones that are the biggest violators now. I'm sure that's how you would do it. And you'd say, here's how it goes. The ones that have the big holes in them, the big gaps in between the lids, replacing those first, giving the people a chance to uh, augment their behavior and giving you a chance to order. Also, imagine that this is going to be part of your protocol for other cities because somebody will see how we're doing it and they'll go, hey, they're doing that over here and they're doing it just like we adopted Boulder for some of our explanations. So. This is something you could program into your overall cost, bringing the cost of each lid down. And as a businessman, you say, if I buy 100 of them, it's one price. If I buy two, it's a, it's a huge price. So if we have a timeline on that, 
um, and then you get a chance to you know work with that and put that into your programming for a, a cost expense to the uh, individual businesses so do okay, we okay we're headed you have enough motion Kelsey do you have enough information okay so what the motion is to go with option two and uh, either recommend recommend them to be locked at all times and to give the option of having a that or a, a bear style lid and I think we're going to get the language from that by looking at a uh, city like Boulder um, yes Reba can we just ask the representative to let us know whether we could actually get all of those bins uh, manufactured and delivered by the summer so that we could be in compliance we can ask them that although I don't think we're going to get a firm answer how about an estimate? Yeah. Yeah. What we can do is in the ordinance is we can set a date for the summer, but also have an ability of a, a business owner to ask for a waiver if they can produce evidence that shows that with diligence they couldn't get it delivered in time. Yeah. That way we don't have to rely on guesstimation. That's agreed. I agree with that. One other thing we need to consider too is if we're giving the businesses an option to choose, we need to consider that time as well. I don't remember what the exact number that was shown earlier, but there's a couple hundred businesses that need to be reached out to and wait for a decision on which way they want to go. So there is additional time that might be required for that as well. So maybe we should add to the ordinance if they don't pick, it defaults to the locking. Uh, Please, yes sure. Yes and yes. <laughs> Thank All right, you. so um, with that being said, as many of the pictures showed, we have a lot of locking bins that are being delivered into the city of Malibu in preparation. Um, when they say go, boom, locks go on, we're good. In regards to a bear bin, uh, there is no waste management from my site services 11 cities and two counties. All throughout Santa Monica Mountains, where there's possibilities of bears, none of those style containers are being used. These are definitely going to be a special order. Um, there's a lot of mechanisms that are go along with those containers too, which are going to take uh, quite a bit of maintenance. Uh, there could be damages and then the lids won't properly work. Um, I know that uh, my boss, Mike Smith, brought in a, an example of a different lid that was a possibility. Um, I would suggest that we lean towards the standard lids that are readily available. Um, even with that, with the number of bins and the communication with our customers, I still feel like year end is probably a reasonable target for us to get through all this container movement within the city. Madam Mayor, the motion is to direct staff to bring back an ordinance and accompanying that is going to be all of um, staff's research on how we can accomplish what the council's goals are. So we'll, in terms of all that, we don't have the information to, to hear it tonight, but we'll make sure that we look into all of that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So the, just so that you guys know, the, the lid that was brought in to us was actually, a, it was a plastic lid, and it looks sort of basically like the one on the bottom left here, where it opened in the middle. Um, the the was, uh, green one. Yeah. Um, that, I, I don't think that um, that kind of lid would have as, as tight of a seal as the metal lid. Um, my inclination, or my intention was to offer to the commercial business of using the, the like one here on the, the, the right on the top that you could use that because you could have access to it all the time and it's those two doors that open are not locked. Maybe the large part is locked, but you can access that at any time and that's not locked. Um, and just for ease of use, but I don't know um, if those aren't, if that's not readily available here in this area, then maybe we just scrap that part of it and just say go with the locking standard plastic lid. The gentleman from Waste Management, um, do you mind coming back to the mic? Sorry about that. Yes. So the bin uh, at the upper right with the two openings, mm -hmm. um, do you have inventory 
of something like that? Zero. Zero in I don't, I don't think that those are, are readily used around here at all. I mean, I think maybe in California and Mammoth or up in the Lake Arrowhead area or something like that. But that's all stuff that, I mean, that's completely unknown at this time. No, nobody has any idea of when that would be available or if it's available out here. If, if I could make one more comment. Some of the, the metal lid, it, that was a uh, equipment that we used long ago. Everything had metal lids, flat metal lids, nothing with a locking me mechanism such as that. But one of the reasons that we moved away from that is customer usage. They're heavy. And you lift them up, and then you're trying to throw a bag in. You'd have to flip them over, but then you have a large, heavy piece of metal that you're working with. Obviously, those have smaller openings, but you still have a little bit of cumbersome accessibility to where a plastic lid somebody could lift up and put over, and then bring it back and lock it. Well, what do we do about that the plastic lids from the photos just don't seem to last that long? They, because they get overstuffed, people break into them. What do we do about that? I think, yeah, the rats are an issue. They're, they, uh, they're going to get in there. We do, there is different um, qualities of lids. There's uh, double walled lids, which I think I saw some that were chewed through also, unfortunately. Um, there's single walled lids. Um, but that might be an option, and those usually don't, you know, get manipulated as easily as the single wall lids. So. Are you commonly using single wall lids now? It depends on the manufacturer which you purchase. You can request them, yes. But they are our lid of choice. The single wall or the double? The double wall. But we, I did see some single wall in our service area here. And the photos were the two photos where the rats ate through them. Did you, were those single or double? Could you tell? I saw definitely one was single, single wall, and then there was I think another one where it was double wall, and there was some activity there. Yeah. So should we make double walled? Probably that what we're looking for here, because I mean the problem is that the the lids do just they just get destroyed, and then there's another cost and a time delay. It seems pretty obvious from looking at the trash cans. They get beat up. They do. They, they go through a process each and every day or whatever the service level may be. They go up. There's opportunity for things to get bent and, you know, slamming around, et cetera. But. All right. So um, I think that does everybody, does anybody have any questions about what my motion Thank is? You. I know you well, want to make it simpler. Yeah, it kind of sounds like you know, having to import lids from Alaska I and mean, they're not really in this western region of the United States might be big of an imposition. Maybe we should just go with the original plan, stick with the original plan and just do the locking thing. With so, the double with the double lids. Yeah. Are we have consensus on the on the fine program too? I think that Chris yeah. gonna, Chrissy's gonna come back with some Christy. Elements yeah. of that, but I think that the vi I, I would suggest that you get one warning, right? Um, That's what we discussed, and that that should be part of the option. Um, yeah, and I agree. Yeah, I agree. You know, and these yeah, fine professionals who've come down here and have been watching this coming their way have been preparing for it. You know, and here we are at the, you know, six months prior, throw a curveball at them. It's like, okay, now we want these like things from Alaska. That's I think that's making it too complicated. I don't know. I think I think they would function pretty well down here, but I'm not. Uh, Maybe that'll be phase two. I guess we're back to penalty, uh, which we could start that draft uh, to educate people. And uh, the I think after a warning letter that uh, we go to code enforcement and make make it revenue neutral, make some kind of a fine. These people's got to start behaving. That's where we're headed. We have an administrative Agreed. citations um, ordinance, and we'll make sure when we bring it back in the ordinance that, that this uh, violation is included in that. I, I will say, as, as obvious as this whole thing ought to be to everybody, if the city could encourage through uh, some kind of a outreach program communication to our business owners, I know it's been done. We may have to double down on that. I think it's kind of exhausted at this point. She's got to send out three letters and the compliance is, I mean. That's terrible. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's a, and managers change, people change at businesses. It's it's we're gonna have to change culture here. Yeah, yeah I mean the letter is gonna be a, a listing of the ordinance and when it's gonna be happening and prepare to get a you know schedule with your waste hauler when they're gonna be re retrofitting your lid. Okay, do we got a motion? Yeah, we need a motion. All right, so the motion is uh, option two. Second. Uh, oh. Councilmember Pete, just to clarify, if you also had Please. talked about double lids. Did you want to include that in the new ordinance? Um, yeah, I, that's the quality of the lids. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't think that we need to specify that. I think that that should be, you know, that's if somebody. I think some people want a lighter lid, so it's lighter for them to lift up, and you know, but the lid can't have a hole in it. If the lid's got a hole in it, they need to be getting a citation. So mm, but I, that that'll solve that problem. I would make a motion. See if there's consensus on having it be a double walled quality. Because then it doesn't deform as soon. It lasts longer. So if you're going to install it and the installation fee is a few dollars more, why not install it once every two or three years rather than once a year? That's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm good with that too. Okay. So, Kelsey, could you try to recapture that for us? As I understand it, Councilmember Peake made a motion for staff to bring back an ordinance uh, as option B, which was to amend Malibu Municipal Code Chapter 8.32 to require locking lids on dumpster bins at all times for commercial solid waste, organic waste, and recycling. And then uh, Mayor Pro Tem Pearson made a friendly amendment to that motion to also require the lids to be the double plastic lids, which I believe Councilmember Peake accepted. Okay, thank you. That's the motion. We have a second. Second. Okay. Can I clarify one thing? What you said, just to make sure. You said the the motion was to that all the dumpsters had to be locking lids. Does is that implicit that they have to be used too, or do we need to add that? Yeah, they don't have to be locked at all. Times. They have to be locked at all times. That'll come down to the specific language okay, in the ordinance. Okay. Just making sure. Exactly. Thank you. I didn't want to miss that. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 I just want to make one last comment because I got some correspondence from people that were saying, hey, what the heck, you know, the council directed this last summer and then the staff changed it. It was good to hear that it was actually these two gentlemen on the environmental uh, sustainability subcommittee that instigated that and clarified that. So I appreciate that. Thank you, Rick. Okay, I'd like to ask for a brief break. It's 8.47, and uh, let's resume not later than 8.55. Thank you.
Thank you, Mikey. Jefferson. Thank you. Here we go. Thank you. Okay, item 6B. Are we ready for a staff report? Thank you. Sure. Good evening, Mayor and Council. The item before you is the mid-year budget report for fiscal year 2019-2020. When the budget was adopted in June, the starting undesignated general fund balance as of July 1st, 2019, was projected to be $24.1 million. The audited undesignated fund balance is now set at $22.8 million, which is $1.3 million less than expected. This is also a decrease from the numbers projected at the first quarter report, and this decrease can be attributed in part to higher than anticipated refunds of permit fees from the fee waiver program. The total starting general fund balance for the year is $22.8 million, and the total of all funds is $29.1 million. So even though it's less, I want to assure you that this reserve balance remains strong and represents 71% of the annual operating budget, so it exceeds City Council policy requiring a 50% reserve. And these amounts have been confirmed by the city's independent auditors as final and have been included in the city's comprehensive annual financial report, which was part of your consent calendar this evening. When we look at the total revenue received through December 31st, 2019, we see that we received $34.3 million, or 56% of the annual budgeted amount. And that's actually unusual we're, that we're tracking that high. Um, many of our funds um, are sort of delayed as we get them a little bit after the mid-year. Sorry, I'm, this is our chronic problem of advancing. Here we go. Uh, general fund revenues were at 16.4 million or 53% of the annual budgeted amount. Um, and I, I'd like to point out, because I'll talk about it a little bit later, that revenues from licenses and permits and revenues from service charges were both coming in at over 80% of the adopted budget. And this is attributable to the strong economy and the high number of non-Woolsey fire-related permit applications that the city has received. Um, in addition to that, the city did receive the $13.6 million settlement uh, from Southern California Edison before the end of the calendar year. And this brings the total general fund revenue to $29.9 million. The expenditure report includes all budget carryovers from the prior year, as well as any appropriations made by the council since July 1st, 2019. Expenditures of all funds total $18.7 million, or 33% of the annual budgeted amount. General fund expenditures through December 31st total $14.1 million, or 41% of the annual budgeted amount. As I mentioned, the city started the fiscal year with a $22.8 million general fund undesignated reserve. The projected general fund undesignated reserve at June 30th, 2020, is $23.2 million, or 72% of the city's annual operating budget. The FEMA reimbursement is shown as a liability against the general fund, as staff is not anticipating receiving the reimbursement in this fiscal year. Again, this reserve exceeds the city council policy mandating a 50% reserve, as well as the goal of maintaining a 65% reserve to ensure the city's high credit rating.
Here we get to the proposed amendments in the mid-year budget. And those are detailed in Exhibit A of Resolution Number 20-05. Planning, Building Safety, and Public Works have all received a much higher number of applications not related to the Woolsey Fire than had been anticipated at the time of budget preparation. Staff estimates increases in the revenue for a variety of fee and permit categories. And the total increase in revenue is projected to be $1.4 million um, higher for the fiscal year. Um, and so you can see uh, this is, as I alluded to before, because we are seeing a higher number of applications not related to Woolsey Fire and our permits and fees and our service charges are tracking, like I said, at 80% of budget, um, we feel comfortable rising, raising our expectations um, in, in revenues to, to these higher amounts. Along with uh, revenues, staff is proposing some amendments to general fund expenditures. And the increase in these project applications has a corresponding increase in the need for additional professional services in planning, building safety, and public works. Additionally, staff is proposing um, an, a, another half-time fire safety liaison position to augment the value of services being provided in public safety. And finally, um, staff is including costs associated with the council's directive to pursue a district-based election initiative on the ballot in November. The proposed $625,000 in additional expenditures would be offset by the additional general fund revenue that we had proposed in the previous slide. In addition to the general fund expenditure, staff is also, whoops, we went too far. Staff has also included additional expenditures related to the Woolsey Fire. Doesn't want to stick on that page. Additional expenditures related to the Woolsey Fire ongoing recovery. When the budget was adopted, staff could only estimate the level of additional consultants necessary to expedite the rebuilding process. At the mid-year point, it's evident that more consulting services are required, um, and these amendments total $1.3 million. And again, remember these are, for the most part, uh, related fees that are related to those projects where we're, we have fee waivers in place. As of December 31st, 2019, the total number of fees waived and refunded for like for like and like for like plus 10% Woolsey Fire rebuilds was approximately $1.8 million. And that's comprised of fees that were waived and fees that were refunded that had been paid prior to the start of this fiscal year. Staff estimates that there are potentially another $681,000 in paid fees that are still eligible for refund but have not yet been requested by the property owner. Many of these are for properties that have submitted the affidavit for primary residency but have not yet turned in a refund request. Staff also projects that the rate of fee waiver eligible projects will be consistent throughout the remainder of the fiscal year. So if we saw $1.3 million of fees that were waived in the first half of the year, they are estimating that that will be the same amount roughly for the second half of the year. Um, at the time of the budget adoption, staff estimated that the fee waivers would total about $2.6 million, and uh, this projected total now is looking like it's gonna be closer to $3.8 million. When council adopted resolution number 19-30, waiving the, the fees for fiscal year 2019-2020, um, there was, it was unclear about how we would handle what happens at the end of that, the fiscal year. So staff is seeking direction from council on how to handle the projects that come in for planning review just before the June 30th, 2020 deadline. Would these qualify for fee waivers for the entirety of the project or for only those fees that have been collected during the fiscal year? 
Um, the Administration and Finance Subcommittee discussed the fee waivers uh, at their January 13th meeting and recommended that the fee waivers be applied to any eligible application received by June 30th, 2020, as long as building permits have been issued for the project by December 31st, 2020. And that is something we'll ask for direction on after I finish the presentation. Additionally, the ANF subcommittee recommended that the costs for the Woolsey Fire recovery process be allocated to the Southern California Edison Woolsey Fire settlement. The $1.3 million in expenditure amendments and the $2.3 million of expenditures in the adopted budget will reduce the $13.6 million settlement fund, leaving $9.9 million. If the council approves this action, the projected general fund undesignated reserve at June 30th, 2020 would increase to $26.2 million or 83% of the annual operating budget. The proposed changes in expenditures total $1.9 million, which would increase the total annual expenditure budget to $58.9 million. In all, the amended budget would include $62.9 million in revenue and $58.9 million in expenditures. The Administration and Finance Subcommittee discussed the amendments on January 13th and recommended approval. Uh, and so now here are the recommended actions. Um, one, we ask you to receive and file the fiscal year 2019-2020 uh, second quarter financial report. Uh, we request that you adopt resolution 20-05, amending the annual budget for fiscal year 2019-2020. That you also adopt resolution number 20-06, amending the authorized positions and salary ranges. And then we ask for direction to staff on, um, on the priorities and departmental tasks on the work program for the fiscal year. And finally, we'd like um, you to provide direction to the staff on the fee waiver program. Regarding the work program, um, we've also, to help in the discussion, uh, staff has included a chart with the status of projects through the second quarter of the fiscal year Pages eight to 10 list items that have been added by the council over the first half of the fiscal year and others that in that time have greatly increased in scope. Um, not by any means completely inclusive, but um, among them are the rodenticide prohibition, the overnight parking ordinance, the short-term rental home sharing ordinance, and the temporary and permanent skate parks. On page 11 of the chart are the items that council requested to be revisited at mid-year for possible inclusion in the 2019-2020 work program. And those are the business licenses, incentives for lower Im smaller lower impact homes, uh, incentives for sustainable building practices, a parking meter implementation program, and an environmental commission. As can be seen from the mid-year budget presentation, there is a very heavy workload in all departments related to the existing work plan, work plan as well as all the additional applications that have been coming in that were unanticipated and the fire rebuilds. It will be difficult to add any new work plan items without eliminating other tasks. Um, at this time, I'm happy to go through amendments one by one or take any questions you have. Um, we also have additional department heads here if, if there are specific questions that I can't answer. Okay, thank you, Lisa. Okay. Why don't we uh, make, make a suggestion? Sure. Um, let's talk about that fee waiver thing, which we talked about in the thing, which is, is get it in by June and have it done by December or the, you know, the, the building part. Does that, does that make sense to you guys what we had at ANF and sort of what our thoughts were on that? That basically if you, if you're a primary resident and you come in um, to submit to planning, we'll, 
and you come in by June 30th of this year, um, we'll waive your fees related to planning, and then we'll waive your building and safety fees provided that you submit to have your final submittal done to building and safety by the end of this year or December 2020. And our our reasoning, I think, for doing that is one, you know, it can't continue forever, um, and sort of to uh, deal with that based on sort of the amount of things that the staff has received at this point and, and where things are going with that. An incentive to get people, you know, who are hesitant to get off the peg, to get, get rolling. I, that makes sense. Thank you. It, it totally makes sense. The one thing I can think about that might catch a few people that I'm aware of is people that are not been reimbursed by insurance because they're in a lawsuit with their insurance company. Um, I know definitely two, maybe three people that are in that situation, and they have not started building because of it. Um, but have they started working on any of their plans or anything? Or they just haven't I don't, started I think anything. they're trying to figure out whether they're going to be able to live in Malibu still. Got it. So um, that's my take on it. I don't know if I heard that directly. but So I could think they might be an outlier, but I don't know. You know that's the only thing that comes to mind. There's probably more than two or three. Um, yeah. I'm in the same situation in my residence outside the city. And, uh, it, but you still can do paperwork and get in the process. And it's nominal, and but if you extend the timeline, if the paperwork is started, seems fair. Like, okay, I've done something. Uh, I got septic sign off. I got soils analysis, uh, geology. You do something to show them that you're in the process. You can manage to pull that out and put it on the credit card or whatever situation you're in. You can get something started, whether you're in the county or the city. And I think that's a fair position is get something on paper, let's move this along, and then if you can't f fully pull it off by the time your insurance coverage kicks you out the door or you have to wind up w waiting for SCE or your mass tort lawsuit, at least you're ready to go when it happens. Jefferson, let me ask your opinion. Do you think that'll, I, I, I maybe I'm just, I don't want to get into outliers, so it's probably an outlier situation where somebody does that to gain value on their property then sells it. So what we, we said is that if somebody goes and the property changes ownership um, and it's not the person that was their primary resident during the fire, that the, none of the fees should be Yeah, and FEMA keeps point. track of that for you as well because FEMA says you're the primary resident, you're the loss, you're the payee for the insurance. You can't transfer that freedom of debt and, and title anywhere. Well, yeah, so, so we what we do it either. talked with, uh, I think it was Yolanda, about at our meeting was we asked her to make sure that she's checking title um, when people are getting those waivers, and they were already doing that, and they're continuing to do that. So that should eliminate any of that happening. And let's also just remember that there we're the only city that has waived any fees. Yes, I think that's very important to point out. And that we are often a model city in everything we do. Including well, dumpsters. And, and neither did the county. I'm not getting any of that from the other resource area and the Woolsey impact area. Right. Okay, so we're in agreement on that then. Yes, I think so. Are, yeah. So, Kelsey, are you good credit with that? to our good financial practices. I mean, Lisa and Riva? Okay, cool. Yeah, and I think what um, we would like to do is bring something back potentially that clarifies this in a resolution so that it's very clear to everyone what the rules are um, so that it, it makes this job easier for staff when they get these questions. Awesome. Uh, so the next thing, Let's see. is there anything that anybody wants to remove from the thing? I mean, I, I guess we can remove the Environmental Commission if we're going to continue with the Environmental. It's, I know it's to be revisited. Yeah. Well, we can remove it too. So I was just yeah, I would the, love the to other see large this. item that uh, Lisa failed to mention that did get added since the budget is the district-based elections, and that's going to take a considerable bit, a considerable amount of staff time over the next few months. Um, our meetings, I believe, both in February will be focused on that. So unfortunately, that's going to delay a lot of our regular work that we had scheduled to come forward to council. So um, that's a late-breaking addition to our work plan. And, and I'm of the belief that on top of that, 
the dealing with the homeless situation, which has just accelerated very fast, and what I believe where we may head is going to take more staff time than we could possibly have anticipated. Um, that's my guess right now. I, can I? I'd like to comment too on the uh, Environmental Commission that um, I know it's difficult for staff. It's difficult financing. I don't think we should lose sight of that though, because it's, we've Agreed. already come this far, and to kind of say goodbye or put it aside, I, you know, that would leave me kind of rough. No, I, I totally agree. This is something I'm very passionate about and believe in, but we're juggling a lot of things. So I, I, I'm willing to push it just six months and look at it again. I mean, I think we got to keep it in our crosshairs. I think it. I think I'd like to see it going before you're out of office, if we could. I think that's reasonable. Then I'll meet you halfway. Un unless somebody has something um, on the second quarter, uh, on this on this fiscal year work plan that they would like to downgrade uh, in exchange for something else, then I don't I don't know where there's room for movement. And I'd like to just remind the council too that we are starting on the development of the next fiscal year budget, and that will be coming forward to council for discussion in April. Um, so, you know, my hope is that we'll have um, more um, bandwidth at that time to take on some of the tasks that I know are extremely important uh, to both the council and the community that we just haven't been able to get to and that were pushed off till now. So. Um, just throwing that back out there as another opportunity to talk about this. And I just want to offer that it's pretty amazing with what we've been through, the worst natural disaster in our history, and the amount of really big items that have actually been done. I think it is actually pretty incredible because I know the staff's working very hard, everyone's working hard. So I think there's it's been it's pretty pretty remarkable. We're on the right path, absolutely. And I want to thank the staff for that. Excellent point. That's, I mean, it is. It's uh, the words of Lou Lamont was, you're only one natural disaster away from bankruptcy. And here it is. We're doing pretty well. So um, thank you for all those who are minding the purse strings for steering a steady course. And, and uh, everyone owes you a debt of gratitude. We're in pretty good shape. I, I agree. And there has been the bandwidth to, to take on a lot of things that are not fire related, obviously. Um, and that's, that's just including the skate park, including <laughs> temporary and permanent skate park. Yeah, say that. A lot of things. Yeah. The unexpected addition. And a lot of things that were on the agenda for a long time, STRs, et cetera, on and on. Rodenticide, some major things that we've, we've really made a lot of headway on. So I, I think, uh, but yes, still with you on the environmental commission. <laughs> I, I met you halfway on that one. Okay, so what is outstanding here? Um, can I make a motion to adopt resolution 20-05 and then uh, to adopt resolution 20-06? And I think that staff is good on the direction that we can receive and file our second quarter financial report. Second. Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Item 6C, Mid-Year Commission Activity Reports. Um, Mayor, um, I don't have a full report on this other than what's in the staff report. This is a re receive and file for the mid-year reports from all of our variety, uh, various commissions. Um, and if there's uh, any desire by the council to amend any of the commission assignments, this would be the time to do it. Um, I know we do have several chairs of our commissions here, um, and we have a speaker slip. Thank you. Right now I have one speaker slip from Chris Frost, Public Safety Commission. Do we have any others? Most of them filed. Okay. Good evening there, up there, Mayor Fair and honorable members of our city council. We have done the following in the, uh, up to this mid-year commission report, provided feedback to staff on scheduled wildfire preparedness activities and events, 
received a report on the results of the city's test of its disaster notification system and provided feedback to staff. <clears throat> Formed the Public Safety Newsletter Ad Hoc Committee to work with staff on coordination and production of a public safety newsletter for the community. Formed the 2020 Public Safety and Preparedness Expo Ad Hoc Committee to assist staff with organization of the community event tentatively scheduled for June 6, 2020. Reaffirmed Chair Frost as the Commission's representative on the Homeless Working Group. Conducted the annual review of public safety services, including reports from the Sheriff's Department, Fire Department, Lifeguards, and Volunteers on Patrol. Received a presentation on the Point Doom Traffic Management Plan Overview and requested staff bring back an item to discuss further where speed humps could be beneficial and would meet standards. Provided a recommendation that the council adopt an ordinance restricting overnight parking on PCH at the following locations. Las Tunas Beach, Sweetwater Mesa to Malibu Pier, Cross Creek Road to Webb Way, the western end of Malibu Road at PCH to Corral Canyon Road, Winding Way to Heathercliff, and Bonsall Drive to the western city limit. Provided feedback to staff regarding the draft evacuation traffic control plan and conducted monthly reviews of projects affecting traffic on PCH and city streets, providing input to staff and Caltrans. That be it. Thank you, Chair Frost. Thank you, Chris. I just want to say uh, I think you've done a fantastic job as chair of the Public Safety Commission. I think your commission's done a great job. You and I talk a great deal. I, I learned so much from you, and I really appreciate all that you've done for the city of Malibu. Thank you very much. That was worth staying for. Thank you. I agree with that. Thank you for your lengthy and continued service to the residents of Malibu. Yeah. Thank you, Chris, Thank you. to you and the whole commission. Public safety is number one. Skyler? I was just going to make a motion to receive and file, um, and that we can adjust the or amend the commission assignments as they request. I don't have an issue with that, if anybody has an issue with that. Or I agree with that. Okay. Is okay, that good? so is that a second, Mikey? Yes. Okay, all in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, thank you. Okay, item 7A. You, Jesse, for the staff report. Good evening again, Mayor Fair, members of City Council. Uh, the request for item 7A is from California Strong to waive their facility use fees related to the Ioki property, uh, which they use for parking for the celebrity softball game at Pepperdine on January 12th. Uh, if you're not familiar with California Strong, they're a nonprofit based in Thousand Oaks, and they provide support to Californians following disasters, including uh, Malibu residents after the Woolsey fire. Uh, the softball game is a significant fundraiser for California Strong, so um, they have asked that the $1,350 fee wa fee fees for the facilities be waived um, so that they can utilize those funds towards the benefactors of, of their organization. I have Michelle Spears here as well if you have any questions for her. And that's it. Thank you, Jesse. Um, I do have a question, Michelle, if you don't mind coming to the podium. Hi, I'd like to thank you for come, coming here and wearing your Run DMC t-shirt <laughs> tonight. I have one too. Um, I have a question here in the report. Um, it says that the event raised over a million dollars. Mm -hmm. Congratulations on that. Thank you. I'm sure it took a lot of work to get to that point. Yeah. Um, but my question related to that is um, with regard to victims of the Woolsey fire, how is that money going to be distributed? We actually, last year, we raised nearly $3 million at last year's event, and which a big portion was given to Wolseley families and residents and uh, community businesses that we had already distributed. We've already done two distribution rounds that we were able to give people checks for. And so what our thing is is me immediate disaster relief versus long-term disaster relief. Was that um, 
an application process? It was an application, yeah. so it was all vetted, it was all done legally, it was all tax-free to our victims, proof of their residency and what, what happened. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the work you do. Thank you, it was great. Hope it's, it's, it's successful this year. I just want to make a motion to waive the fees uh, that are referenced here. Do we have a second? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. It. I'll make a motion to adjourn in memory of those nine passengers aboard that helicopter that tragically uh, went yeah. down. Over and I have some additions to uh, our adjournment. Excuse me one second. Sorry, just one second. Need my notes. I'll add the names that I meant to on Wednesday. Thank you, Skylar. Okay, All right. we're Thank adjourned. You. Thank you. <laughs>